And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, back to the Valley of the Judged. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me as always is my good brother here in the temple, the man of a thousand runes, the CEO of Zadare Enterprises, and the bane of my fucking existence, good brother Xanatrix. I have a crippling plamo addiction. Please feed it. <laughs> um... No, all we, all we have to do is just say that your plano addiction is is really really strong. <laughs> well, no, wait, hold on. I could write it off as a business expense inside Zadari Enterprises. These are concept models. Concept models, legally distinct from whatever the source model you might be thinking of is. <laughs> so some of you might be looking at the, at the setup here and asking a couple of questions. One of them being, didn't you already didn't you already do new did you already do new Edo? Which, kinda. And some of you also might be looking at, at this and going, "This isn't Veil of the Void," which is true. That's that's on Friday. But I had pro but now and yes, I did. We did cover new Edo. Well, well I did. When I had the when I had the creator of it on the show, however, I did promise him that I was going to do a look at the quick start when the opportunity came, and thus we thus I pres and thus that brings us to the present. Although calling this a quick start is a little generous. I mean, monk. Let's be fair, it's not the full game. Thus, by definition, it's a quick start guide. I will give it one th I will give it one thing. Um the tidebreak compared to say the tidebreaker quick start, um, someone could reasonably run a campaign using just this. True. The tidebreaker quick start is much more suited towards like single session play to get a taste. Um, single session play or a or a demo with extra steps. Yeah. Um. I'd say it, I'd say it's more I'd say it's more akin to those demo discs that you may have gotten from PlayStation Underground if you were sub to that at any point. I remember some of the discs. Mm -hmm. But what what do I mean when I say calling it is calling that is generous? This thing is 127 pages long. In word, or the equivalent thereof. Yeah. So, what that'll eventually translate to, as I'm sure parts of this will be directly transplanted in the final book, Part depending the... on. But he did say that this was, that the bulk of the rules were get, were going to be in here, but the but um a lot of, a lot of what's be what's going to be added in the final book is going to be um a lot of the fluff. Yeah. And probably more art and stuff. Yeah. I know that there is some art here, but you know you're gonna have your like background patterns and such. Um, and then, of course, depending on the text, the text he chooses and the size, uh, this could all clean up to like what is right now in a Google Doc could all clean up to something like yeah. less pages because it's all squished together as smaller text. Now. I did that inter I will link that interview that I did that I did with creator Russell Wo Rollins. Um, try saying that five times fast. And the I will. In the in the description of this video, the only bad thing I have to say about him is that he has to is that because of his location, he has to deal he has to share space with Leafs fans, even though he isn't one. I don't think that's a bad thing about him. Then it's just commiseration with his circumstances yeah i just had i just had to make that joke i just had to make that joke because make because shitting on leafs fans will never not be funny there are whipping boy for a reason mm -hmm. oh and much much like cowboys fans and you bet your ass i was having a field day with that oh my god <laughs> oh that was good that was some good shit oh now since that since that interview was way back in November, I do feel obligated to do a bit of catch up. 
New Edo, as, as, as you can see, refers to itself as a Neon Samurai TTRPG. Contrary to what to um, first appearances, New Edo is not necessarily a cyberpunk game. There are there are certainly going to be elements, especially given the impact that um, 80s and 90s cyberpunk had. But th but it's but it's as much of a cyberpunk game as say Tenra is. With it, with with its Kami network and the and the cybernetics with the Kijin. <laughs> ah, Tenra Bancho. I still need to pay, play more of that. I.e., the elements are there, but it's not the it's not the focus. The focus is being well, Neon Samurai. You are a sci-fi samurai doing sci-fi samurai things. Mm -hmm. Now. With that, with that in mind, the other, the other thing I will note is is um again is the name that he gave for the game system, Clem, Crunch Light, easily managed, which, as I do with a lot of my reviews, this is one of those things we're gonna come back to down down the road tonight. Because how how often have we see, how often have we seen how light a how light a game is. And then, ha and then have to call that into question at times. Looking at I, you, Cogent. I think we can name... It'd be more easy to list when that hasn't happened, Monk. Look, I don't want to use this to dunk on 5e. 5e. I've done that enough this week. But I mean... That's what immediately comes to mind when it comes to people saying that a game is easy to get into. Yeah, well, well. Besides, you wouldn't dunk on Five E. It's already on the ground. You'd kick it. That's true. Probably be probably be a repeat of the whole um, the whole head the whole head punt at the end of Duke Nukem. <laughs> or uh, or the uh, age old Simpsons meme. Well, there's well that doesn't exactly narrow it down much. There's a. <laughs> And Simpson that have become memes. Well, everyone knows. Stop! He's already dead. Fair point. <laughs> but I, but they did. I do appreciate that. Really early on, we have an FAQ that lays out some lays out some of the um, core things to know. Yeah, such as that's the basic, such as the basic game system. Which is going to be trait plus skill versus a target number, and is made very clear that it that it will be familiar to fans of certain other samurai games, and anyone who has played World of Darkness. So, that should have been White Wolf because it's also common and exalted. Yeah. Oh, as far the there are, there are three questions. That was the first one. The second one is: Is there magic? Yes, there is. It's created by the Kami. Um, and we'll get to how we'll get to how that works um, later. And are there combat stances? No. And the reason that they gave is in in trying to keep combat efficient, we haven't included stances explicitly. By default, there are two game mechanics that can give your character a more or less aggressive combat position. Characters only get one quick action per turn, and both the dodge skill and free attack. Against exposed enemies, use that quick action. So in any given round, your character can either take extra shots at enemies or act defensively and dodge incoming attacks, but not both. Stance-ish. I mean, that's a that's pretty close to what we're kind of doing with FF Legend. Mm -hmm. Although we don't have quick actions, you just have your reaction. Yeah, we ha you have reactions. We didn't put we didn't put an upper limit on it. Um. Largely, largely because we didn't see a need when, when um, just taking a just taking that reaction is going to be a gamble. Yep. <laughs> no upper limit, but you might fuck yourself. <laughs> so then we have a bit of a welcome to New Edo, and then we have the why play this game. And I, I just want to read off the answer to why play this game, um, straight off. Do you like samurai and lasers? Monsters from yes. mythology. Yes. 
espionage, sabotage, and deceit. Yes, yes, and yes. Magic, cybernetic augmentations, and a good bowl of noodles. Fuck yes. I presume that he says. I presume if we've got this far, the answer is yes to at least one of these. Well, it was all of them, and so I can confidently declare that New Edo is for you. I feel like he's talking to me personally. <laughs> <laughs> the game's systems were built to provide ample character customization, but that in itself doesn't make New Edo a good game. The following aspects of the game make it differentiated and a, re and a rewarding use of your limited hobby time. Two systems, the Fate card and your character's legend, ensure that no two characters will be the same. We'll, hope we'll be getting to those later. Character Could we use the... Good. Could we use your Fatum deck for fate cards? <laughs> um, <laughs> default Fatum? No. It's too there we'd have to we'd have to uh, we'd only be able to use that if we cut out a bunch of cards that don't fit. Yeah. Um the Dark Myths deck that I'm that I'm currently waiting on and th and thankfully um I managed to get the address corrected before be, before they shipped out. Nice. Because the last thing I need is another case of sending it to my old place. Um, I'll... That one, there might be a better chance because Fatum Dark Myths is more contemporary. So nice. you could squint your eyes and, mo and move it to New Edo. It's going gonna, it's gonna to take some work regardless, but it'd be easier. I, I just like to think of ways things can interact. That's all. Uh, let's see, character customization is robust without requiring twenty source books or forcing the toy storyteller to get a PhD in the game's mechanics. I feel called out. You're not the only one, monk. Need I go over to my? Frankly, forced upon me folder of 3.5 EPDFs. <laughs> Let's not and say we didn't. Look, there's like 50 books in there. There's like 50 fucking books in there. I'm worse. We'll believe oh, I'm, that. Oh, I'm, I know. I'm, I'm just pointing out one folder in my gaming books folder. Mm -hmm. No two characters will be the same, and players will be able to guide each step of development. The systems were designed to encourage synergistic play. Characters may be tough on their own, but they are even better in a squad. Keen players will notice ample opportunity to add to both their own and their allies' efficiency as characters evolve at the table. Why do I feel like someone... like We've just been hitting a bunch of, uh, a bunch of systems recently. Uh, Heavens and Heresies, and now, um, I mean, even Tidebreaker had a little bit of team play uh, in its quick start mentioned. Mm -hmm. I feel like synergistic play and high levels of customization we're seeing in a bunch of mechanics, not just here, but a bunch of places that we've been looking at. And um, I hope that's a good trend. I hope. I'd say it. I'd say it is, especially since. I honestly think that the f that the fetish for for um, uber simplified rules light is going out the window, which is good. I mean, I still I still see stuff for powered by the apocalypse, but I haven't seen as much stuff for fate. Well, and PBTA. I wouldn't exactly say it's rules light. PBTA has some weird areas of crunch in it like there's there's you, you're chewing through a nice uh soft angel food cake uh muffin and then you hit like a crunchy peanut on the inside or something mm -hmm. but i i actually like each one that we've we've brought up recently with uh with uh valley We've seen that synergism and character customization. And whenever I see character customization, my brain immediately just rushes endorphins. It's like, ooh, light bulb moment. Do I get to theory craft for literally hours while doing anything else? Yes. <laughs> uh, 
for what multitasking. It, for, what for what it's worth, I do remember when I did that interview. I um I ended up going through the eight great clans, and and how you and how you'd adapt those. Some oh were, Jesus! Some were easier than others. I didn't go through all the I didn't go through all the schools. Just the general vibe with the clans, because if I went through all the schools, I'd be here all day. Yep. Um, no, I just I uh. It's it's I guess for me the uh. The, High levels of character customization that are fun. It's jangling keys. You're jangling keys. That's my jangling keys weakness. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> the next, the next bullet point is New Edo is set at multiple inflection points between tradition and change, past and future, and character actions are intended to guide the future of the setting. Will the Empire fully embrace technology and these social advancements of the 21st century, or hold to its own ways, preserving tradition, duty, and honor? Will it open its doors to the world or remain isolated? Eh. And that, cer that certainly fit that certainly fits the subject matter. And once again, I have to bring up that a similar thing happened with Tenra. the d The difference is that the question was on the um, status of, on the status of the Shin on the knowledge that the Shinto priesthood has. Yeah. As the northern and southern cores had a di had a disagreement about whether or not they should start working more openly instead of instead of drip feeding their technology to feudal lords. Yeah. Well, also this is this is a game designed by someone in the west whereas, you know, Tenra is designed by the Japanese. Surprising how they came to some similar ideas. I'd say I'd say that's because the concept of tra of tradition of the old versus the new is a very common motif in storytelling. Oh yeah, um, tradition versus uh, real progress, mm -hmm. uh, and I, and I and I'm and I hate that I have to emphasize real progress because oh, fuck the eternally offended. But um... yeah, so then we get into who this guide is for. Then what do you what do you need, and what's not included, and basic basically, what it what isn't included is the more detailed stuff as well as the more high ranking material. Mm hmm. I am. Um, I uh I like the fact that it doesn't look like this requires any d twenties. They mentioned four, six, eight, ten, and twelve, but not twenty. Mm -hmm. And lots of them, huh? Hold, 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 hold on a second. Yeah, okay. I saw that coming. I, oh, this is this is my big, big bag. This has like just random, lots of random. Yep. Then, then we have a nice. A, I always like when we have a diagram of how, of how the character sheet is going to look like. Yeah, it's pretty nice. And for the, for this one, I do I do like the setup here. It's uh, it's clean. Mm -hmm. Has some very straightforward uh particulars. You know, you've got you've got quite a few straightforward. Uh, I mean, the wound the wound track alone. <laughs> Burning legend <laughs> for your worst wound. Mm -hmm. Nice. Um, you know, it's got your main traits and your core traits and derived traits, and it even shows how they relate to each other with little arrows. That's really fucking cool. Mm -hmm. Um, I even like. Wow differentiated elemental soak or i should say damage type soak because elemental is a damage type in this game yep that's pretty cool i like this little this this is a cool little character sheet now then we get into the introductions which is go which is going into the the um, core stuff the core stuff that y that you're going to be doing in the type of stories it 
says it says outright the gate that it's going to revolve around three types of conflict: intrigue, espionage, and combat. Ah, oh, always always nice when the design pillars are laid out right in front of you. Now, I'm going to assume intrigue means investigation, espionage means active infiltration, and of course, combat seems self-explanatory. Mm -hmm. Um. I'd also like to point out that some of the little flavors here uh, state that New Edo is a world where belief defines reality, mm -hmm. and that part of the reason the Empire is on these sets of inflection points is because they believe as much in monsters and magic as they do lasers and robots. That's pretty cool. So let's. See. I do. I do like the. F there are no classes, you'll, although your path will teach you fun shit, which is which is def definitely going to be nice. Um, <laughs> Literally, your path teaches you fun shit. That's good. Yep. Then we get into material on the um, on the setting, as well. So the thing, so some of the stuff with monsters and myths, including a lot of the monsters we'd expect. So Bakeneko, Kitsune, Oni, all the good stuff. Oh. Let's see, then we then we have the whole thing with magic, where it's list, it's listed. Magic in New Edo is based on your ability to coerce the kami spirits to do something impossible for you. Not everyone can speak to the kami, and most people go through their lives believing in the spirits of everyday things, but not interacting with them. Despite that, the kami are as common as air, and infuse every part of the city, from its dusty train tracks to its expansive parks and waterways. Kami embody the spirit of concepts, things, or ideas that are important to the population, making them nearly unlimited in their forms. It requires some of the shin shinpi trait to speak to the kami and cajole them into doing magic for you so keep an eye out on ways to get your hands on some shin pee um, for uh oh uh, go ahead um when i uh, when i first saw this i had immediately had to bring up you were you had played l5r hadn't you because this is the this is not too far removed from how shugenja work yeah um i i would like to point out uh for those of you not in the know about the different type of kami, uh, when mentioning kami of everyday things, that's Tsukumogami, mm -hmm. and uh, those can eventually become yokai, like the walking one-eyed umbrella that is a very common yokai trope. Mm -hmm. So, um, I like that. Also, for anyone scratching their head and going, what's all this weeb shit? The game's called New Edo. I don't think I don't think we're going to be attracting any of the grogs with this one, but we always say fuck the grogs. The grogs can suck dick. We'll have more fun than they will. Yeah, just not mine. I don't want to get any. Each other's. It's a circle jerk around there, monk. <laughs> you know it is. Oh yeah. Um. Then we have technology. Um, technology is advanced, but not so much to be unrecognizable. <clears throat> Lasers and maglev exist but are not yet common. Hologram technology has taken over the advertising industry in recent years, but the daily life of an average New Edo citizen is not much different than in our own world. People still use phones to communicate, swords and gunpowder firearms to kill each other, and ride bicycles to work. Most vehicles, including the city's excellent rail transit system, are electric, but diesels are still used in heavy applications. The most notable technological difference between our world and New Edo's is the common use of cybernetic augmentations. Augmentations, or AUGs, are technological implants that provide that improve some part of your character's biological body, making them stronger, faster, or tougher, etc. So, Go ahead. so are, are we saying that every one of these is going to be a bullpup rifle embedded in your arm? First off, I hate bullpups. Stayer Og, Monk. Exception. That's why I said Stayer Ogs. <laughs> um, 
We'll get we'll get to we'll get to that later. Um, Gun arms. <laughs> are you only bring are you only bring up the are you only bringing up the gun arm because I'm black? No, because Dine was white. <sighs> and anyways, <laughs> I'm bringing up the bullpup because you hate it. Augs may get may give your character a shortcut to super strength or a fleet of drone spies, but these implants also come with an inherent risk of biofeedback as your neural system rejects the overload of digital input. Basically, human brain not made to have more pieces than it usually has. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to corpse, and this is the thing that's going to discount it from a lot of people's view of cyberpunk, corpse aren't the real power of the city. They're entrenched cultural instit the at least so far. They play an active role in the politics of New, of New Edo through bribery and blackmail, but rarely act openly against the government or establishment. Sounds like our government. Intercorp warfare has become more common in recent years as they test the limits of what society will accept from them. Personal violence is rare, but media manipulation, espionage, and spin campaigns and sabotage have started to hint that at the kind of corporate impunity that other game settings embrace as the status quo. So, it, so if you so, this is a, this is a nice way to go to go into the whole idea of if you want to have the whole the corpse run everything. Here's how you can do it, but you don't have to. And oh, go ahead. For me personally, I think that that kind of concept in SF is overdone because there's this idea that if you're doing a a um f a future or near future setting that you have to do that kind of thing. Yeah, it's a uh, very cynical and frankly biased view of of um the corruption of capitalism as well. But the the big thing here is that this is not yet th 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 what what this is essentially saying is this is a world that could potentially become Shadowrun, but it's not yet Shadowrun. Mm -hmm. Um. Which is nice. Uh, now, whether or not that makes this closer or further from cyberpunk, um, you've heard us talk about cyberpunk in the past briefly from time to time. The whole corpos being in control and being the bad guys is not actually a defining trait of cyberpunk. It is one of the traits most commonly associated with it due to the popularization of things like, well, again, Shadowrun. Or even older than that, um, technically, I think Metropolis. Yeah. Um, and but it doesn't have to be that way. And this is a good way to say it doesn't have to be that way because this makes this this puts you in a pre cyberpunk world. There's also pre corpos mm -hmm. or pre pre corpo corpo as the government. Yeah. And for me. For me, per for me personally, I always define I always define cyberpunk as the middle ground between the technophobic and the technophilic. Yeah, I can see that. Oh. The middle ground between uh, luddites and and um, <laughs> the middle. If we're gonna go with true extremes here, middle ground between luddites <laughs> and uh, transhumanists. <laughs> Then we get into the into um crime. We get into crime and violence. Brazen crime is relatively rare. Um, and to enforce discipline, the Neo Sama Police Unit was created early in the 21st century, which is a pseudo military force to create a stark and immediate deterrent to violent crime, operating on an eye for an eye judicial structure that isn't afraid of casualties. So, if you see. If you've seen, a, if you've watched or read anything from eighty two thousand, and ju and just a lot of Masamune Shiro's work, you've seen this in some form, whether it be <laughs> Section Nine in Ghost in the Shell or Eastwant in Appleseed. Or um, I could think of something else that isn't Shiro, but fits this, um, just not quite as totalitarian as as the actual sources. Psychopaths. Psychopaths fits here too. Yeah, petty crime is rare. 
but a few se a few seedier districts come with higher risk. Basically, don't go to the bad parts of town if you don't want to get robbed. Mm -hmm. Organized crime, on the other hand, is common. Some groups operate with relative impunity, due in part to the careful manipulation of their image as community leaders and engaged citizens. I think so Terry the... Pratchett once said, "If the crime is, there's always going to be crime, so it may as well be organized." Yeah, and I was gonna, I was gonna say something like. So the Bloods before they got fucked over by uh by drugs. Mm -hmm. Um. Also, this this is clearly playing into the uh, yakuza um image because, well, if we're gonna romanticize the good, might as well also romanticize the bad. Mm -hmm. No Kiryu's here though. Maybe some Majimas. Not yet. <laughs> And we have a bit of the the data web, which is basically the, basically their um, internet slash matrix. You get the idea. Um, and ap apparent the way they have it set up is that the web evolved in a piecemeal pattern focused on sovereign control rather than a free market. The day to day effects of this are relatively minor. It may be harder to get immediate information on remote countries, but you can still look up lots of porn and order noodles within seconds. So, China? From a security perspective, though, the web is much more defensible on a local scale. Many companies and families create their own intrawebs that are almost invulnerable without local access. That means it is much harder to hack into a remote server nab some information or sow some chaos, then log out all from the comfort of your mom's basement. Hackers require a physical access point to most secure webs, which means heading out into the field, preferably with an armed guard or ten. Anything worth stealing or destroying will be behind a hard access bridge. You're going to have to get your hands dirty. This analog aspect of the internet was included in New Edo to avoid the pitfalls of one or two characters disappearing into the Matrix for hours at a time, while everyone else sits around eating noodles and playing on their phones, both in and out of game. I'm glad that this is one of those things that's addressed, because that has been a problem I've had with hacking systems in Cyberpunk games for years. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, it does ignore how, even in a, in a world where everybody makes their own sovereign intrawebs, um logically the the logical progression would still lead to you being able to remote hack anything just about um but you know this is a game we don't have to be realistic this is fantastic i like the idea that that now there's a there's actually a reason you can't get into that remote system other than black ice yeah <laughs> oh you mean need me to connect to the fucking server physically with an actual data port what the shit is this the 1970s yeah Hang on a second, let me... Ch Sorry, I, I thought I, I was thinking of something, but then it, sl then it slipped. Um, then we have the whole thing with modern, glo with modern global politics. Um, it didn't make any new enemies by staying neutral during the conflicts of the 20th century, but it didn't make any new friends either. And while they welcome a limited amount of international tourism, almost no foreigners come to the country to stay. International treaties and trade are maintained with other global powers, as the, and the Empire is viewed more reclusive than isolationist. But that becomes more fraught with each passing year. So, this is a version of Japan that never had the post-war economic miracle. There are two major powers that compete with the em Empire in her sphere of influence, the Collective and the Imperium. The Collective is based only a few hundred kilometers away on the mainland, and has <laughs> become increasingly aggressive in the past two decades, <laughs> testing w with them with minor naval skirmishes. The Collective is, chi is basically China. The Collective outright is just fucking China and Russia both combined into, into super communist aids. Mm -hmm. Whereas, and Whereas the Imperium, not that one, is based across the Pacific Ocean as in, and is in the waning years of its hegemony, 
but remains a powerful influence in the region. Imper then again, um, Shiro did have a did have America as a empire in Ghost in the Shell. Yep. Um, this isn't the first time America America just decided fuck that democracy thing. We're an empire now. The Empire is stuck between these powers, one rising and one falling, and its situation creates a difficult political situation at home. The nation is not strong enough to resist the sheer bulk of the collective expanding influence alone, but alliance with the Imperium would stoke, would stoke further flames locally and only delay what many see as the inevitable. Um, when I read through that, what I'm kind of reminded of, to an extent, is the, su is the subtext that was within... Um, the return of Godzilla. Okay. Where you had, where um, where when it came to the Godzilla question, you had representatives from both the U.S. and Russia, um, argu arguing arguing that you that um, you can't you you can't use conventional weapons against Godzilla. You got to nuke the guy. Mm -hmm. And the prime minister gets both of them to back off, saying, "Would you be willing to nuke your own country?" Yep. Oh, basic, basically depicting Japan as, as a, as being stuck, being stuck in the middle of two elephants. Yeah, stuck in the middle of two elephants, and also, I mean, when it comes specifically to, to Godzilla, Godzilla has always been an anti-nuclear weapon story. Mm -hmm. Um, so the whole "Would you be willing to nuke your own country?" thing, uh, that out outright is is. A Japanese person going, "Fuck you! You nuked us twice. Eat shit." Mm -hmm. So then, then we get to characters in conflict. He goes, "So you like the setting? Now what?" As an aside, I do like the um, less sti the less stiff way that the, that the rule set is written here. Yeah, I I like the uh, the candor. Mm -hmm. I guess is the best word. Yep. So then, then it goes into the. <laughs> goes into the um, the three pillars and we kind of get an answer to what you're asking about with intrigue intrigue games will focus on the Byzantine and often insidious imperial court of the empire which is seated in New Edo and the politics of the city L5R flashbacks it's not the first time we could almost I know make, we could almost make a drinking game out of that <laughs> oh please we'd be dead by the end of this monk this which is why I'm not doing it um and none of us are, are recommending it either. None of you start a drinking game about L5R references in this quick start. We are not responsible. This is a disclaimer right now. We are not responsible if you start that and die. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But the future of the city and the empire depends more on the deals won and lost between power brokers than it does on shit-kicking samurai or bazooka-wielding oni. I.e., your social skills are what are what's going to keep you alive in the on the intrigue games. Espionage games focus on either intercorporate warfare, which is mostly nonviolent. Dot dot dot. <laughs> or on the growing influence of the collective and the Imperium within the Empire. These are two different very, two very different contexts. But both will use the Empire's subter character subterfuge and guile more than their ability to chop fools up. I mean, there'll still be some chopping up of fools, but sabotage, infiltration, spying, hacking, deceit, and seduction will play a greater role in your adventure. Espionage games off often end up with characters being very rich or very dead. So, in intrigue games are your um, Chinese court drama uh, epics. Mm -hmm. Espionage games... Are your uh, are your James Bonds? I was gonna go with either. I was almost tempted. I was almost tempted to go with um, Golgo Thirteen. Yeah, but Monk, I I'm gonna be honest here. This is weeb enough that we've probably lost half of the people with the references. Golgo Thirteen loses all of them. Like you and I are probably the only people who know it. Get good, get more gooder, as my mentor would say. Get good scrubs, yes. Um, finally, combat 
games are the type of hack and slash adventure popularized by video games. Combat games tend to deal with three primary themes. New versus old, where the Tycoon and the Eiko and their various allies battle it out to assert control over the future of New Edo. Cops versus robbers, aka Payday 2, where where characters either play as or try to shut down the city's expansive networks of organized crime. And three, us versus them, where characters join forces to fight the demons and monsters of lore, which aren't just sitting around waiting for the civilized people of the city to get done killing each other. Oh. So the three th the three themes, the new the new ver the new versus old. Um I don't I don't know why I I don't know I don't know why, but I end up I end up thinking of um of a lot of a lot of ma a lot of magic versus te versus tech RTSs that I've played over the years. Um, Can't imagine why the cops versus robbers thing. I already I already mentioned Payday Two. Um, yep. So on the other end of the spectrum, um, something like SWAT, just with a whole lot less of "Sir, you're in my way." <laughs> and as far as the uh, as far as the us versus them, um. We did a whole episode of the Geek Watch podcast just ex just exploring that secret guardians concept. Yep. Or um I mean I would I would make it cuz they mentioned oni and civilized people killing each other. Um I would almost go SCP Foundation. Um the other thing that we can go with the whole us versus them thing Mm -hmm. Devil may cry. <laughs> well, hell, if we're gonna go that far, monk, just a uh, new getter robo from two thousand eight, us versus the oni, literally. <laughs> yeah. I'd... The set. The sad thing is, I could easily see. I could easily see Devil May Cry as an establishment in New Edo, based on how based on how things are set up here. True, and. Dante would actually probably get a lot more business and be a lot more lucrative. Mm -hmm. um, and still spend it all on pizza. <laughs> well, Man's got his priorities. I'd imagine pizza is probably it'd probably be more expensive in Japan. Then again, then again, I uh, then again, I make a thanks to Hachiko District. I have been, uh, I have been made a, I have been. I've been developing a short list of places that I'm pro places that I'm probably going to go for food challenges if I ever go to Japan. <laughs> All of Hachiko District is that at this point, I swear. <laughs> and I love it. Oh. Uh, the and but any, anyway, cuz many of the seeming non-combat paths are actually well suited to combat games in supporting roles. And having an Earth Dragon or Envoy in your group will always make will almost always make the squad more effective as a whole. I am glad that th that um when it comes to the builds there isn't there isn't dividing lines in that that far. I mean, as much as I love L five R, it does it does divide these schools pretty distinctly in that regard. There's not a when it comes to classes that could be when it comes to not classes but archetypes that are kind of in betweeners. There's real. There's really only two general archetypes I can think of, and even th and even then it's and even then it's kind of cheating. Mm -hmm. That being, uh, monks and shinobi. Don't call them ninja. Not unless you want to get killed in your sleep. Mm-hmm. Uh, see, then we have the whole thing of character legacy, which. Is which fits into the whole your tr your character your f um shaping the future of New Edo in your campaign. And then he goes with that in mind. Let's get into the fun stuff. Yes. So we have char we have character basics. Many character many multiple playable races called your lineage, and a fluid class <laughs> system. Players are encouraged to build a legend around their characters. Then we have the following terms that'll come up regularly: lineage, which is basically race in this thing. Faction, your group, clan, or gang you most commonly associate with. Path, the school of learning, i.e., well, schools. Core traits, self-explanatory. 
Shinpi, which is also a core trait, but only certain paths have access to it, granting you the ability to speak with the kami or der and derive magical effects. Derive traits, self-explanatory. Skills, also self-explanatory. Augmentations, once again, <laughs> once again, picking these has the risk of biofeedback damage. Yep. Uh, backgrounds, which lets you define where you came from and give your character context. And legend, which reflects how famous or infamous they are in New Edo. I like a. I like. There's this. Uh, you increase your legend by doing legendary things. Obviously. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, hang on. Let me gr let me grab the character. Sh let me grab the um, character sheet. Which I am very glad that the character sheet we have here is um is form fillable. Mm hmm. There have been, there have been, because, well, when it comes to review time, it makes my job easy. Uh, yeah. We get to basic game systems. So, first off, explosive dice. <laughs> when you roll a d10 and you get a 10, you get to roll that die again and add your result. This is known as, an effect known as exploding. And explosions are cumulative. Only 10s explode. No other die can be cumulatively rolled when they roll their highest value. So to be very specific, it's only exploding D10s. Yes. That's reasonable. Mm -hmm. Keeps the, things from getting really fucky. Yep. Um, any roll is referred to as a contest. So you roll a number of dice, add them up, compare it to a target number. So, once again, I'm reminded more of L5R than I am of Storyteller. Yeah. And we have basic contests, opposed contests, and extended contests. Um, as well as the concept of rolling their fate, which we'll get to later. Mm -hmm. Let's see, then legendary, then legendary actions. During any contest, you can choose to use up to 10 points of your temporary legend to add to your dice pool. So legend is going to be our equivalent of edge, willpower, or since we're bringing up L5R a lot, void points. Yep, it's your extra effort. Mm -hmm. You can use that temp legend to boost a skill roll and attempt something that might seem ridiculous. Uh, that there's a lot of things that seem ridiculous depending on setting. Yep, but there is a catch: if you attempt a legend boosted skill roll and fail. You lose one point of permanent legend as everyone watches them shit the bed, probably on camera. Basically, you're shamed into into losing some legend. Mm -hmm. I think that's a good way to keep to um keep people from just dumping legend whenever whenever they get the chance. Yeah. Because obviously, getting that getting permanent legend back is not is not going to be all that easy. Yeah. But then we have the fate card. Every character has a fate, legendary or mundane, heroic or vile, and that is recorded on your fate card. Two characters with otherwise identical capac capabilities may have very different fates, and the story of that would be reflected on their fate card or FC. Then they show what it starts to look like on the back. The fate card on the character sheet is blank, but you fill in the 1 to 3 in front of botch line and 95 to 100 in front of the crit line. Use pencil because things will change. Mm hmm So a key part of New Edo's rule system is rolling your fate. Once per round, before you roll a die pool for a contest, you must roll your fate using two D10s or a D100 if you have one. Nobody, nobody rolls a 100-sided dice. Yeah, about? nobody nobody rolls what is essentially a um golf ball. A golf ball covered with a plastic shell with some beads in it. Yeah, um don't hit a driver with a D100. It doesn't go it doesn't go well. <laughs> and there's my golf joke for the day. Um compare the results of your fate of your fate card and apply any actions before continuing with your contest dice pool roll. Every path has a unique fate line, but there are dozens of other ways 
to add to your fate card in New Edo. If you get a critical success or botched, you don't need to roll your dice pool because the results have already been determined. You succeed spectacularly or fail hard. Nice. This is something I don't think we've seen a whole lot of times. This idea of ch of checking to s checking to see how we how well or how terrible your die your die roll is going to be before you make it. Mm -hmm. A lot of times, crits and botches are integrated within the die roll. Yeah, and this um, this is also um, different to things like the computer die and paranoia mm -hmm. or other um, quote unquote destiny dice or whatever you want to call them, um, where you roll them alongside your dice pool. This is rolled prior to. Now, with the, with that in with that in mind, let's see that. Let me go to adding to your fate card. As your character develops, there will be ample opportunity to add to or change your fate card. Paths and skills, for example, often include line items to add to it, or to change the numbers of existing line items on it. But and when we get to character development. There'll be some more details on the development of that of the fate card, but then we have a few examples. Um, add a three percent chance to grant ally free attack is one example. Add a five percent chance to heal five HP. A three percent chance of of gain an extra attack after you take your first. Increase your crit or botch chance by one per, by one percent. I'm honestly surprised that um no that nobody has tried to use the fate card with rune quest. Reduce botch chance by one yeah, percent. My bad. <laughs> oh. Why would you want to increase your botch chance? That doesn't sound like a good idea. Mm -hmm. But yeah, with um, I could see a fate card being useful with other systems. Yep. Uh, remember, when when you're told to roll your fate, you do so before rolling any other dice. Apply any fate card results before moving on to your normal dice pool rolls, if you do. And you may only roll your fate once per round unless an ability specifically says otherwise. So then we ha I do li I do understand why um why there was a whole lot of talk about the fate card. Which I I dipped into during the interview, but I was I was kind of I was flying semi blind about it. But it's good. It's good to have. It's good to have some proper perspective. Uh, then we get um, crits and botches. You can only crit or botch when you roll your fate. The results of a normal dice pool never indicate anything other than mundane success or failure. So a crit on an attack means you hit your target and roll all damage dice twice. If you get to roll d10s, these are also rolled twice and may continue to explode as usual. If you would rather roll your attack, for for example, you intend to add a lot of raises, you may do so instead of taking the automatic success, and instead you gain plus 1d10 to your attack roll. The critical damage bonus is ignored in this case. Any other, any other crit results in a spectacular success as determined by the storyteller. Although I love the example here. You may roll a crit when trying to seduce an unsuspecting guard, so instead of just swaying him, you convert him to your cause and add him to your list of contacts. <laughs> I am... Um, I am suddenly reminded of the copypasta of the uh, crit successes and crit botch chain that lead to an, uh, an elf and an orc getting married. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Botches are bad. Botch results are up to the storyteller, but may include embarrassing or painful effects like dropping your gun, tripping down the stairs, or farting while trying to seduce that guard. They're, they're not intended to cause you harm, but at the very least they mean you can do little other than recover for this turn, and you automatically fail the, the contest you were rolling for. Yeah, imagine if your, critical, if your botch was so bad the fart kills the guard. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> oh. Advantage and disadvantage. These there are only two modifiers that come into play outside of what is recorded on your sheet. 
When you have advantage, you add 1d10 to your die pool. When you have disadvantage, you subtract 1d10 from your die pool. If you have no d10s to roll, you subtract your highest dice instead. When in, when in doubt, apply advantage or disadvantage. If neither seems reasonable, then the action is either free or doesn't require a roll, or it's impossible, and you simply can't roll it. Hmm. Uh, then we have the whole thing with times, as well as the rest, and how, how, much, you, how much you recover during a rest. Uh, as well as time as well as time in combat then we get to legend your fame or infamy renown and reputation indeed and first we go into the meta of why is there a statistic in the game based on your character's fame and reputation because young samurai your life depends on it the heroes and anti-heroes of New Edo are not mundane. They are magical creatures and mythical warriors with abilities that defy reality. They move faster, hit harder, look better, and think deeper than the average person ever could. As individuals, though, each superhuman character depends on the belief of New Edo's regular population for those abilities. If no one believes in you or cares about you, you're nothing. You may think you're the baddest of asses, but if a grandmother cuts in front of you at the supermarket, you're just a delusional douchebag. In New Edo, belief defines reality. Yokai exists because people believe they do. A samurai can cut a bullet in half because onlookers know she can. A cancer patient trusts that her Way of Five practitioner can restore her health. Even the most subtle, most unobtrusive assassin draws on the belief of his clan when the lights come on and sirens start wailing. Accent, actions engender fame. Fame creates belief. Belief fuels greater actions. Feedback loop. Positive feedback loop of do cool shit, get legend, do cooler shit, get more legend. Mm -hmm. Oh. So that... Then we go... Then we go... We go into a bit of creating your own legend. Oh. And I do think I do think that I do think that it's quite telling that it says legend holds no moral value. It is a qualification of how well known you are for doing that thing you do best. As your character progresses through adventures, you'll have many opportunities to choose between actions, and and you, all that is going to slowly build your legend. Not all legends are grown on tales of violence or combat, though. Hackers, geisha, spies, spin doctors, and tycoons all have their own legends and can be as well known as the deadliest samurai in New Edo. This also doesn't mean that every character in New Edo is intended to be a glory hog. A reliable medic who saves the lives of fellow soldiers doesn't need to tout his own worth. A good songwriter, songwriter appreciates the proper credit and royalties from a huge pop star singing the words he has written. And a strong policymaker may never make headlines, but her investments and career will always drift upwards regardless of the polls. Legend is one of the few statistics in New Edo that does not come in ranks. Instead, it is an absolute number that reflects how famous you are. It is granted by doing legendary things, obviously, and also fuels your ability to do those things. Beings with a bigger legend can do crazier shit. Like your HP, legend has a maximum and a current value, self which is self-explanatory. And... You can also get you can also immediately get new temporary and permanent legend by doing awesome shit in game. Ah, st ah, we're seeing we're seeing the return of the stunt bonus. Yep. Um. And your your legend has four very tangible effects. It is a measure of your rank. You pr your progress through the ranks slash levels of your path is determined by your legend score. As you gain legend, you're, at, you're granted access to higher tiers of learning. As such, legend is a measure of your level, through, though path rank is not the only factor determining how powerful you are. You gain ranks in your path as your legend score increases. And the way it's set up with this... Um, one, we know that, it's, that, that path ranks are going to cap at 5. Mm -hmm. Two, I'm kind of reminded of insight rank with this setup. Okay. And and 
since this isn't like they they stated earlier, this isn't traditional uh, classes with levels. You're following those paths to get certain features at certain ranks. Um, but there's a whole bunch of other factors that come in. It's very likely that what you get from your path is going to be very, very vital, but, you know, it's also going to help you get all that other outside shit, too. Yes. Each character starts with as much legend as their highest core trait, so if Savvy at 23 is your highest core trait, mark your starting legend as 23. You may not have done much yet, but the block knows how good you are with numbers. Don't worry about changing how you create your character just to squeeze an extra point of two or legend because you'll soon make it up during play. Legend is also a health reserve. If you suffer enough damage to be reduced to zero HP, you hit you hit the burning legend wound level. You're beat to shit, but you can keep going, albeit with a skill roll penalty of minus 10. Any further damage to you comes straight off your pool of available temporary legend, but you suffer no further increase to TN. Thus, it's possible to continue fighting for a significant amount of time after you should have been killed. Ah, the Ben K model. Yeah, I mean, he does say, picture a famous swordsman fighting off dozens of attackers despite numerous cuts that should have killed him, or dazzling stunt driver remaining awake behind the wheel, rushing their allies to safety while bleeding from what would otherwise be a fatal gunshot wound. See, and as a fuel source, legend is your store of key or willpower, the belief of others that gives you the power to do superhuman things. Some abilities require that you spend legend points to use them. At first, this may seem counterintuitive, as your actions are supposed to bring you legend, not expend it. But if you do not dig deep for the convic conviction, the sense of self necessary to complete that amazing feat, you will fail. Thus, the most amazing actions and powers require that you spend your legend to make them real. In doing so, of course, you hope that you succeed and that your legend will grow in turn by the com by the completion of those feats. Um, and okay, this is this is going to be really bad, but you you do realize that this means that the power of friendship is a tangible thing you can take advantage of here. <laughs> Taya would fit right in. Oh. Um. Especially abridged Taya. Thank you, little Karibo. Now, as far as regaining it, there are three ways to do that. One, do awesome shit. That is the best thing. <laughs> two, I'm sorry, I, I really don't need more other than that, but yeah, let's keep going. Two, rest. Three, the follower's background. There are some skills and ability that give you ways to regain legends, so keep your eyes open. Let's see, and then we get then we get after all of that we get into character creation itself. Oh. It is based on a priority by system that excludes your lineage and path, which are created equal in power to each other. Then you have to assign a priority to the remaining five sets of abilities that characters may have. Traits, skills, augmentations, magic, and backgrounds. In that regard, it's not too far removed from the priority system that was introduced in Shadowrun 5th Edition, and is used in Blade of the Iron Throne and um, Song of Swords. Yeah. Uh, basically, you take each of those that I mentioned that I just mentioned, rank them in order from A to E. Yep. And that determines how much you're gonna how much you're gonna spend. So just to use um just use priority A, if you put that in core traits, you've got 46 points to spend on those. If you spend that on skills, you've got a t you've got 2d12, 3d8, 3d6, and 44 for your skills. Um, if augs, you you've got you've got 54 points of tr of trait, as well as noise and Hisanaka lineage option. Um, at magic, you get a bonus tier one, two, or three root, plus nine shinpi and a bonus mikata. And if in backgrounds, you'd get 60 points. Yep. Some 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 ones to note. If uh if you choose E for Augs or Magic, you can never use Augs, or you can never gain Sheen P or Cast Roads. Mm -hmm. uh. Now, 
there are a few clarifications. All your cores traits start at 10, except Shinpi, which starts at 0, unless your path says otherwise. You can assign 15 priority points to any one trait at character creation, so no dumping. Now, bonus trait points gained by any other factor are not counted towards that maximum of 15. Mm -hmm. You can only assign priority points to Shinpi if you've already been granted some amount of Shinpi by your lineage, path, or choice in magic priority. So basically, if you choose C, you can pour some points into Shinpi. Mm -hmm. Let's see, then the, sk then the skills... And the, the first time through processing the skill dice may seem a bit confusing. Then they have a discussion on s how skill dice work. We'll be getting to that later. Ah, so you roll when you roll a contest, you roll a trait plus a skill, and your skill dice can be any of D4, D6, D8, or D12. You can combine different dice in a skill. So if you have rank 3 investigation, you may, you may have a D4, D6, and D12 to roll, for example. See, then we have augs. Augmentations are measured by their trait noise, the drain created on your body by each installation. They also have ranks, which multiply the effect of trait noise while providing you with better bonuses. In effect, trait noise limits how many augs you can install in your body based on your core traits. At character creation, you can use these priority points to buy augs based on their trait noise as a cost. For reference, 54 points of trait noise could get you two very powerful augs or nine minor ones. And augs at character creation cap at rank three. If you choose priority E, well, as we said before, you cannot you cannot take you cannot take any augs, period. Yep, that character is forever augless. Mm -hmm. If you choose priority A for augs, you can take the Hisanaka lineage if you desire, it's not mandatory as they are half-mortal, half-machines that used to be another lineage, but have morphed themselves into technological marvels over time. Um, They're the only lineage that requires a priority purchase. And if you do have leftover priority points after spending augs, you can put them into traits, but no more than six. Yeah. Let's see, then when, then when it comes to magic, as we mentioned before, this is measured by Shinpi, your, which, and your choice of magic in priority will grant you some bonus magical abilities, including extra rotes, Shinpi, or a Mikata. Oh, at priority E, you're deaf to the kami and, can no lo and cannot speak to them, or cast any magic, period. C and B give you a bonus ro give you a bonus rote, which we'll get into later. And at priority A, you get a Mikata, or a Spirit Familiar. Uh, and if Magic Priority grants you a bonus rote, then you're considered to have access to the Kami that grants that rote. This has two benefits. If you gain a Mikata, you can choose to use that Kami as your Mikata. And you can also learn new rotes from that Kami's list with experience points later in the game. Now when it comes to backgrounds, there are only five of them as opposed to the smorgasbord there were in Shadowrun. Mm -hmm. Age, contacts, followers, status, and wealth. These are measured in 1 to 100. By default, characters all start with one point in each. However, you however backgrounds are capped at sixty one. At character creation. Mm -hmm. At character creation. Let's see, then we have character development. Augmentations can be purchased with cash. The only limiting factor to how many augs you have is one, your available funds, and two, the trait noise you'll accumulate by installing augs. Let's see, and then we have. Then we have system averages and target no and TN averages, Bas basically to get basically to guide so that so that people aren't um ha aren't having to deal with ridiculously high target numbers out of the gate. Mm -hmm. uh, then we get 
Then we get to Lineage and Path. Like I said, Lineages are basically going to be races, and as, f as far as what we have available... Um, but bef actually, before I get to what's available, there's the fact that the that when you p when you pick a lineage, you get all of the physiology benefits, as well as the choice of one of the culture benefits. So at the very least, we're not doing a one size fits all when it comes to the lineages. Mm -hmm. so the first one we have is Bake Nekos. Uh, okay. See then human, which which self self explanatory. Well, I'd like to I'd like to point out that um, their culture bonuses just because most people when they think human they think bog standard. Mm -hmm. um, culture bonus one: uh, add five percent human ingenuity line to your fate card. When you roll this fate, you may re-roll your next skill roll, keeping either result. If you re-roll any d10s and get a 10, the, in the results explode as usual, and you keep the entire cumulative result. Mm -hmm. Or you add the 5% human tenacity line to your fate card. When you roll this fate, you immediately regain 5 points of temporary legend and 5 HP. Man! Mm -hmm. That's a hard choice! <laughs> Legit, though! Mm -hmm. Um... Kappa, which has the which has the options of plus three per first culture option plus three perception, add three percent, gain one point of the contacts background to your fate card, or gain one level of two weapon fighting. Um, and we have the Karasu, which. One, they get they get a they get th their own little action known as flying lunge. But their first culture option plus three heart, add five percent, add three meters to your move this turn to fate. Or culture two plus three savvy and have advantage on all tactics rolls. Damn. Then we have Kitsune. Their first culture option gra grants plus three savvy and you automatically know if someone is lying to you. This only functions in per this only functions in person. Or two, you gain a Mikata, choosing from any of the Mikata described on the magic chapter. This excludes Kami rank tier one or higher unless your path grants you access to those Kami. If you would otherwise gain a Mikata Kami via path or priority choices, you do not gain two Mikata. Rather double the bonus received from your Mikata. Mm-hmm. Uh, see then we have Oni. So you can either have plus three power, plus two ar elemental and arcane silk, or plus three presence, and add five percent. One, one target within ten meters becomes afraid of you for your path rank rounds onto your fate card. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see, then we have Saru, basically monkey people. Yep. Which can either get two weapon fighting or plus three savvy and a one d eight rank in either crafting or set or a savvy skill. Let's see, then we have Tanuki. And I'm I'm gonna be skim I'm gonna be skimming through because there's a fair bit of um of lineages. Mm -hmm. So Tanuki, you know, you if you're if you're a sufficient amount of weeb, you know what a Tanuki is. Usagi. Testicles. Usagi, you know, you probably know what that you probably know what the a Usagi is. Mm -hmm. Um, and Hisanaka, i.e., these these are the people who are pro are probably cl are. I would I would call them street Sam, but I think but they go way past that. Mm-hmm. Like so I'd, I'd say the Hisanaka are more like casts from Fantasy Star. Mm-hmm. Um, I think an important note here is when you choose to play a Hisanaka, you first select a, a natural lineage and one culture from that lineage and gain all the bonuses. Then assign priority A to augmentations in the character creation process. You'll get all the lineages bonuses plus... Uh, you may elect to be size 4, 5, or 6, but this choice is permanent. You get plus 3 power. You are immune to biological damage. Hisanaka are not immune to the interrupt effects of biofeedback, 
but do not take any damage when they when they roll this fate. You gain plus five resolve, and your rest modifier is increased by times one. Mm -hmm. See, then we have factions and paths. There are no classes, as we mentioned before. Said we just have said we just have um, fact we have paths, and each pa and each path is associated with a greater faction. So, each path grants some basic starting equipment, which, for the purposes of the quick start, is limited to weapons, armor, and clothing. Clothing quality is subjective, but weapon, but armor and weapons can be chosen from the tables later on. Um, each path grants g bonus skills at every rank, which is a function of your legend. You'll be presented with three skills to choose from and can mix and match as your character gains in ranks. You also gain a... F focus of 1d8 in the bonus skill you choose. These bonus skills are entirely separate from the skill dice you get as part of character creation and may take a skill above rank 3 at character creation. Uh, paths each have unique abilities and fates associated with their teachings. Rank 1 and rank 2 pass abilities are presented here, but, you're, but you may eventually gain up to 5 ranks in a path. So, then, so then we have the factions. Um, first one that they give is the Aiko, who are the traditionalists within New Edo. And the paths that you have are the Earth Dragons, which see themselves as the natural le as the natural leaders. Uh, basi basically, the generalist arc the general archetype. Yeah. Let's see. And that, and um, their their rank one and two abilities they nearly cease eight they nearly cease aging, um, at rank one once they reach adulthood. And gain twenty free points to spend on backgrounds and have no maximum limit on background scores at character creation. You also gain fifteen percent strategic opportunity to the fate card. When you roll this, you and your allies within ten, within 10 meters gain a plus 3 bonus to their attack and damage rolls for this combat. And this bonus can stack. So that's the reason why they mentioned Earth Dragons would be useful in combat. Mm -hmm. um, you, add your, you add your rank to all tactics and intimidation rolls. And add a 2% grant ally free attack to your fate card. As well as 5% um, to the strategic opportunity line to fate i think that these are the abilities you can choose from um no it said rank at rank one and two yeah I th yeah you're you're right it is a case of what you can choose from i think it hopefully in the f i think this is a consequence of them of using um word f a word equivalent for this because those kind of things will probably be their own bullet points yeah, um, yeah. you you, you'll be presented with three skills to choose from. Mm -hmm. You can mix and match as your character gains yeah. and ranks. And also the bonus skills. You gain 1d8 in either eloquence, intimidation, or tactics. Mm -hmm. um, so next is the Boar Clan, which they're definitely berserkers. Yeah. Um, and in fact, one of, their, one of the abilities that they can get is, dis is Dismember on their fate card at 10%. So when you roll Dismember, your next successful attack does double damage. If your target has a permanent legend score equal to 50% or less of yours, you can remove one of their limbs or head if the damage would kill them. If the target survives, they're afflicted with bleeding for your for rank damage per turn. I, I, like, that actually... they're the, I like that they're the Berserkers without, ha without having to have some sort of rage mechanic. Yeah. Also, I'd like to correct myself. I reread uh, part two for path descriptions. The three skills are just that, the three bonus skills. Mm -hmm. Then the third path says the path each have unique abilities and fates associated with their teachings. Rank one and rank two path abilities are presented here. I I don't I just think you get all of that. I don't think you choose. Alright, All right. Ho hopefully, hopefully the full book will clarify that. Yeah, because now I'm slightly confused. Mm -hmm. Point of clarification necessary. Um, 
the third path is the pet is the path is um clan Musashika who huh. are referred to as I wonder why it's called that. <laughs> refined officers, charming duelists or distinguished politicians. And let's see. Think they get a they get fifty they get fifteen percent repost to their to their FC and at rank two one level of two weapon fighting so <laughs> I yeah like I said I, I wonder why they're called that but that's all of the Aiko faction paths the next the um next faction they give is the Tech Tekun Alliance who are basically the technologists um who are trying who they believe are. Are, they believe that they're trying to pull the empire out of what they believe is a militaristic patriarchal past. It advocates for diversity and immigration, promotes egalitarianism, and favors progressive taxation. Um, let's see. Then we have the first path is the envoys, which is what you'd expect from an envoy. Then the operatives, who are the frontline fighters. And I'd say I'd say operatives would be Street Sam. Mm-hmm. Let's see, then we have the Sabishi. Who are the skill monkeys. <laughs> Although when I when I look at the skill list, one thing that I can't help but notice, unlike certain games, we d I don't see direct combat skills. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh. The next faction is the Orange Umbrella, which is a secret organization. Essentially, essentially it says that they that they are an ancient alliance whose agents seek seek to balance power in the empire, never letting the pendulum swing too far from the center. They're Comstar. Oh, so the first path is the is the Oiran, Oi, oh. which is a high level geisha. Yep. No, I mean that's literally what Oiran means. Let's see, then you have the Rooster Clan: assassins, saboteurs, spies, ghosts. Rooster Clan are whispered about, and their presence is warded against. Neo Edel wants to believe that the Rooster Clan is a thing of the past, but it is not. Ninjas. I'm I'm not going to apologize for what I'm about to say. But these two paths can be summarized as flashy pussy hidden cock. The next faction we have is the Seven Swords. Wait a minute, Exia? Gundam Double O? What the <laughs> fuck? Who used to be used to be um, monks, devotees, and aesthetics, but the, but they but now they're now they're mercenaries. So the first path that they have is the Guild of Tears. Orewa Gundam ga? Oh. Or Orega Gundam, I should say. <laughs> Orega Gundam. Yeah. There you go. My Who best set's my impression. Described as pure professional warfighters. Oh, then we have the Soul Eaters. Who are who um are essentially ex monks. And I, although I'd say I'd say based on their um, rank one and two abilities, um, they're snipers, especially with the <laughs> first rank one ability. You are always considered at long range for the purpose of determining the TN to hit you with projectile weapons. Wow, they're they're magic snipers because they get shimpy. Yep. Oh, then we have the Speakers faction, which is basically the opposite of the Seven Swords. And I'd say, I'd say this, I remember when I was going over this and I was like, 
It's the Phoenix Clan. <laughs> yep. The first path they have is the Shugonshi. Who huh, are... why does that sound so very familiar? Who are def who are definitely the classical mystics. They get ten Shinpi right out of the fucking gate. And a Mik and a Mikata from any of the Mikata Kami or Tier One Kami. As well Jesus. as access to all Tier 1 Kami and learn three rotes total from among their lists. Jesus. So for, the, for those who want to do all of the casting, there's the path for you. You are the castiest caster that ever did cast. Mm -hmm. Let's see, the, then we have the Way of Five. Who are, de who are definitely going to be your Heladins. Especially, especially given one, of, especially given one of their rank one abilities, a fifteen percent regenerate line to the FC. When you roll regenerate, you or a target within five meters of you gains rank D ten HP immediately. Jesus. Which at rank two can expand to twenty percent regenerate. <laughs> yeah. Let's see. Then we have the next faction. We have is the. Metro Response Directorate. Sounds like the cops. Yep, it's the cops. Are we Section 9? Oh. We Section 9, boys! <laughs> then we have respond Responders. The ones who run towards trouble with the aim of saving lives. So you're, so you're beat cops. Or you're Bambalance. Mm -hmm. Oh. And the... In, up to, and including the fact that one of the, that one of their fate abilities at rank one is called call for backup. I need backup. <laughs> oh, the next one is inspect inspectors, so detectives. Bum ba dum ba dum, inspector gadget. <laughs> oh. And the third one is the Hitokage, the Surveillance and Infiltration Team. They are Section 9. I fucking called it! Let's see. For responders, um, Boma. <laughs> Inspectors, Togusa. <laughs> Hitokage, Kusanagi. <laughs> it's fucking Section 9. I mean, you can create a holographic duplicate of yourself. It, it that that is Motokok Snuggy all over. Oh, then we have the Orderly Beneficent Association. Murderous, violent, deceitful, debauched, and unerringly polite. Members of the OBA are infamous gangsters who run most of Nueto's underworld. Just because we have to break a few kneecaps doesn't mean we can't give you service with a smile. So the first path that they have is architects, the puppet, oh, the puppet masters who seek to make New Edo dance to their tune. Literally? Figuratively? Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh. Including the... F and the, their whole thing... Oh, the, right out of the gate, they're all about they're all about having leverage over people. In fact, that's their fate card ability. Um, then we have the Kyodai, the frontline soldiers. They typically have excellent manners, but very short tempers, and are famous for their casual approach to violence. Often heavily tattooed and well dressed, they are proud of their OBA membership and flaunt it openly. So Kyodai means sibling in Japanese, people. Yep. You want you you wanted you wanted your Kiryu and and the like. Um, this is this is the path to do both Kiryu and Majima. They just probably do it differently. I think this would probably be more uh, more Majima than Kiryu. Probably. And lastly, we have unaligned paths, which is. Self-explanatory, much like the independent tracks we have with our project. Indeed. Let's see, we have the Bozu, who are exactly what you would think something called the Bozu would be. 
It's your 80s biker gangs all over again. Mm -hmm. I wonder if they all have um, pompadours then. I think that's a up to the GM kind of thing. You know what? It isn't properly Bozu without pompadours! <laughs> uh, and the ghost talkers who are prophets of a machine future. Oh, hey, there's our tr transhumanists. And the and the way the way that they're described, it's implied that they're not that they're not exactly on the not exactly on the up and up on the sanity scale. Um, it sounds to me like they're operators in in the Matrix, actually. Wizards, hackers, and psychopaths. The Ghost Stalkers have only a tenuous grasp on physical reality, as they view the mundane realm through the lens of binary code. Sounds to me like the operators. Yep. And Clan Onikiri, the mon i.e. the monster hunters. I mean, it's in the name. Onikiri. Onikutter. Um, Makai Knights. That's immediately what I end up thinking of. Uh, I mean, considering you get magic? Yeah. Let's see, the, the, the Makai Knights, um... The sorcerers in Jujutsu Jiu Kaisen, any anime that de any anime that deals with an organization that hunts monsters that e that the public doesn't know about, that's Clan Me Onikiri. There's this great idea for a video game, a game where you, with nothing but your skill and the weapon on your back, take down giant fauna, monstrous you could call them, and you track <laughs> them and you kill them. Almost like you're hunting them. Man, it's <laughs> it's it's too bad we don't have a video game like that. <sighs> you could call it something like Monstrous Hunting. I don't know. Uh, that be that being said that being said, then we the last path that we have to look at is the Onmyonji. Yumo Guegue Fighty. Oh, wait, that's the wrong chant. That's Chinese. We're dealing with Japanese. I, that's why I said it's the wrong chant! Yep. So, Onmyonji are exactly what you'd think they are. I have slips of paper, and they kill you. Mm -hmm. um, although, in, although, in the setting of New, Ed New Edo, the Onmyonji have fallen. A bit out of favor. Modern ones may or may not hold a grudge against politics. But, but I'd... But... The, let's see here. The interesting thing is that... It, is that... They don't... Unless I'm, mis unless I'm mistaken, or maybe this will be added in later. They don't... They don't grant... Um, they don't grant Shinpi. Which like is... Other clan, which makes sense, because actual traditional Onmyoji don't uh, appeal to the kami. They appeal to fundamental forces. Mm -hmm. um, which is why it says, While undoubtedly mystical, this path does not teach its adherents how to speak with the spirits. Rather, it imbues a unique, malleable form of magic that seems alien to the other paths. And then at uh, rank 2, the rank 2 ability says... You gain one Onmyodo point each round. You may use your Onmyodo point with a quick action on your turn, which generates a, vi a variety of mystical effects that last until the start of your next turn. You may choose from the following effects for your Onmyodo point. Add rank times two to one of your move, defense, or resolve. Add plus rank to the result of any one skill roll this turn. Gain the ability to see in the thermal spectrum to a distance of 10 meters. Create one brief, harmless, mystical effect. A puff of smoke, a flash of light, some non-violent, erratic behavior from an electronic device, an unintelligible sound. Mm -hmm. So, three combat things, and then one prestidigitation. Let's not forget that they have item affinity, which, which is basically the whole pull an, ob pull an object to your hand. Yes. Um, <laughs> and it is not. Im and what I find kind of interesting about item in uh, item affinity, it is not impeded by physical barriers such as glass, 
or how tightly someone is gripping the item, but you must be able to see your target. It's force pull. Yep. You must be reasonably be able to be held or carried, if not used, in one hand for this fate to work. Um, I wonder if that means that if somebody rolled right, they could um, steal someone's gun. Yes. <laughs> A gun can be held in one hand, depending on the type of gun. That would that would that would probably be one of the best one of the best examples of call an ambulance, but not for me. <laughs> that old man is so cool. <laughs> Somebody call for help. Call an ambulance, but not for me. Mm -hmm. Oh, see, then we get into core traits, which which are also used to calculate derived traits. Um, oh, and uh, and how you how you measure them. And since, since since you can't roll a twenty-two, core traits are defined by their rank, which is simply its multiple of ten. When yeah. asked to roll your trait, you'd roll the number of d ten equal to your equal to your rank. And on and you do not roll the the um si the singles die is not at, is not added as a solid modifier. I.e., you don't roll 3d10 plus 9 if your savvy is 39. You just roll 3d10. Mm -hmm. And if you ha if you have less than 10 in a core trait, you do not roll any d10s for contests that use that trait. <laughs> then we ha then we have ex we have the whole thing with exploders, which we already which we already talked about, and the. Uh -huh. The traits are as follows: heart, power, reflex, presence, perception, shavi, and shinpi. And then, yep. we, then the derived traits: defense, resolve, which is basically your social defense, initiative, self-explanatory, um, health pool, also self-explanatory, size. Which is going to range from 1 to 10. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Humans are size 5. Oni are size 4. Uh, it goes... So size 1 is the biggest and size 10 is the smallest. Yep. Um, Oni are size 4. Hisanaka may be size 4, 5, or 6. And th and this is important because it determines your move. Move is reflex plus heart divided by your size in meters. Yeah. So if you want to be that big guy, you can, but it also it also means you're not going to be moving much. Mighty glacier. Which is the opposite of how it typically works, because you look at say dwarf. Usually, most ra most races in a, in a given um, game that has a grid system will have a movement speed of thirty feet. That's usually mm -hmm. the standard, except for things like dwarves, be which have a movement speed of twenty. With the argument being, well, they're short, so they're taking smaller strides. Yeah. Whereas in this case, if you're if you're bigger, then you've got more bulk to move. Mm -hmm. Not to mention, if you're bigger, your armor has to be bigger on your body, your weapons yep. are likely scaled to you. Yeah. It's probably a, a hundred different flavor factors, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Let's see, then we have skills. The skills have two ratings, rank and focus. The rank is how many dots or levels your character has in that skill, from, zero, from inexperienced at zero to expert at five. Focus is what die you you choose to assign that skill at each rank, with the understanding that bigger die cost more XP. Skills may be assigned a focus of D4, D6, D8, or D12. Only core traits use D10s. Mm -hmm. Let's see. So it get the, you must have three ranks of a particular s skill with each rank assigned a different focus. So it gives an example. Salty the Sabishi is adept with building and repairing machinery and equipment, as reflected in his hardware skill. He has three ranks in the skill, 
with a D8, D8, and D12 focus assigned to those ranks. When he needs to roll to a repair something, he rolls his savvy plus his hardware and compares the total and compares the total um, total number against the tar against against the target number and his task. Blah. English monk. Two D eight plus two D ten plus one D twelve is actually quite good for a spread. So not, so th this this marks a very interesting use of skills because a lot of times skills are very, but are very um. I guess linear in how in how in how they are how they work and how they're upgraded. Mm -hmm. Like each with each each time you put each time you put in a dot, you're putting in a die type. I think that's why it said earlier that it might be confusing at first for people when it comes to skills. Yeah. Um, something to point out. Um, in game terms, taking a skill at a lower focus will grant characters quick, cheap access to unique abilities associated with each rank of a given skill, but at the expense of lower dice controlled anytime they need to use... or lower dice rolled, excuse me, anytime they need to use that skill in a contest... Focus choices cannot be changed or improved later. If you dabbled in unarmed combat and took a first rank at D4, then discovered you, lo you love it, you could later commit to unarmed D4, then D12, and then unarmed D4, D12, D8, but you could never increase the initial focus of four. Mm -hmm. So what, whatever you choose to focus in, be very careful. Especially since you're not going to be able to roll all of your focus die. You're only picking one. Um, unless I'm mis unless I'm misreading it, the example given says he rolls his savvy plus his hardware, which is all three focus die. Oh, D two okay. D eight plus one D twelve. Okay, I, t I, t I stand corrected on that. Take that back. But even then, if you're putting D fours into a skill, that's still just D fours. Mm -hmm. That's not a lot of variance and a very low ceiling. Which is probably why we used it for our extra effort die. <laughs> hey, it works in our system, but our system's different. Mm -hmm. But you also you may also gain special powers or abilities based on what ranks you have reached in a particular skill. I'm being reminded of the mastery abilities that were in uh, the skill system in L5R third edition. They were in fourth edition, but not as prominent. Mm -hmm. Uh once you reach a rank, you gain the ability. Not every skill rank has abilities, though. Don't be greedy. Let's see. And if a skill grants an ability that creates a modifier written as rank times 2 or rank times 5, you multiply your current rank in that skill to determine your final number. Example, the sleight of hand rank 2 grants you a permanent automatic bonus to your defense trait of rank. Thus, when you first gain this ability at rank 2, your defense is raised by 2. If you later raise Sleight of Hand to rank 4, your bonus becomes 4. Good way to keep early uh, bonuses relevant. Yep. Then we have the skip and... <clears throat> we have the... F As one would expect, we have each skill associated with, with, a, di with a different trait. And yep. each of them... So, and there's a varying approach, but it seems that the pattern is you're either going to get, you're going to get one at, at some combination of rank one, two, three, and four and five, with the four and five sa stating, um, available in the full book. Some aren't give, some don't give any at all, like luck. Yeah, but that's because luck does something else. Mm -hmm. See then power skills, and light and um melee weapons are considered power skills as well as unarmed combat. Then and throwing. Have, yep. Then we. Ha then we have um, then we have heart skills. Which there's only four. There's only four of them. Then pre then um presence. 
I do like that it calls the that calls seduction the oldest skill in society. <laughs> Just like prostitution's the oldest profession. Mm -hmm. um, let's see then per perception skills. I love the description that they put in for archery. Don't let those barbarians with the guns have all the fun. Why not use an archaic piece of wood and string to fight the laser wielding maniacs instead? Yeah. Yeah. Uh. Oh. That sounds like fun. Mm -hmm. Let's see. And, of course, small arms counts under this as well as gunnery. Gunnery is for the bigger stuff. I do love that the rank 3 benefit is called Rambo. <laughs> um. But small arms is pistols, revolvers, shotguns, and submachine guns. Point and sh point and shoot all day, baby. Um. And as as I've as I've joked about in the past, I I will always find it funny that militaries have a very interesting definition of what counts as small arms. I mean, anything that isn't a missile, monk. Yes. Because somehow, somehow, a friggin' chain gun is small arms. Because it can be carried by a single person. <laughs> anyway, Let's see. Then we have the then we have the savvy skills. I do like that. Arcana and computers are both counted as savvy. Got to <laughs> use your thinking cap. This is one of those instances where the do, where the two column format with word documents ends up fucking with me. I'm assuming mm -hmm. I'm assuming that it's going to be more cohesively presented in the full book, obviously. Hopefully so. Um, then we have augmentations, which augs have first off augs have ranks, just like most of your abilities, increasing from rank one to rank five. Lower augs cost less to install in money and the demand on your bo on your body, but their effects are weaker than high-ranking augs. When you're when you acquire a new aug, you must choose which rank you'd like to install. Ranks are limited by your core traits, so you so you won't always have the option to install the most powerful rank in any given aug, even if you had the money for it. Once you've installed mm -hmm. Aug at a rank, it's costly to, to upgrade to the next rank, but not impossible. Then we have the whole thing with Trait Noise. Which, I'd say, tra I'd say Trait Noise is the, is the equivalent to, human to um, Empathy in um, Cyberpunk or, re or um, Essence in Shadowrun. But it's, but it's, it's not as damning. And nope. the, way, the way that it's set up, if somebody wanted to be a cyborg who could also cast magic, I think that they could. They could. It, There's nothing preventing you from having Shin P as, a, as an augment. Mm -hmm. Well, Shin P while having augments, let me phrase that better. Yes. It, what it, trait noise is, trait noise can be basically summed up as the capacity, as the capacity. And what I find interesting is the fact that it isn't a case where all, unlike unlike what I mentioned before with empathy or essence, it isn't a all roads lead to Rome scenario when it comes yeah. to how, when it comes to how it works, because the the arm ex, the arm example that they give has has a trait noise of heart six power four. Mm -hmm. So you would add you would add that to the trait noise part on the character sheet. Um, and no, I don't think I don't think you add that to trait noise. I think that's what the number you're comparing to trait noise. I think because trait noise is a stat. It comes from character creation. Yep, it, it. Your body can accept can only accept augs and trait noise up to the maximum value of your core traits. On the yeah. character sheet, the the core trait statistic 
statistics have space for trait noise. You need to determine the trait noise total for all your augs and add the total for each core add the total for each core trait to your character sheet. You can only install augs while your core traits are greater than the trait noise caused by your augs. Okay. Then why did it say you get fifty four trait noise if um, you get A? I think I think what it was saying is that the total amount of trait noise in um, character creation can't extend can't extend past that. Okay. Okay. But of course, it also ha it also has to fit within the trait no within the trait noise. The thing. normal trait noise thing, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's basically like getting a a certain number of points of your a bit of your um, core traits. Yeah. See, then there's the whole thing with biofeedback. When you install your first AUG, you add a new line to your Fate card called Biofeedback Effect. The Biofeedback rating of each of your AUGs adds to this line on your Fate card cumulatively. So if you have five AUGs installed, each with Biofeedback 1%, the Biofeedback Effect line on your FC should have 1% times 5, or just 5% of it happening. When you roll and you get bi and you get biofeedback, you take 1d10 biological damage as your neural network temporarily overloads. Any action that you're about to take automatically fails, and your and then your turn ends, and you can take no more actions until the next round. Certain abilities reduce your biofeedback effect chance, but otherwise you continue to accumulate greater and greater risk of biofeedback with the installation of each AUG. Mm hmm So I'm actually glad that I do, that we don't have an equivalent of the counting of the counting down thing that we've seen so often in a lot of cyberpunk games. Mm -hmm. Where if you end, if you end up going past this, then you turn into a cyber zombie or something. Yeah, where, this just says yeah you you've you've hit, you've hit your cap. You can't install anymore until you get a be stronger and better with your body. Mm -hmm. Of course, as was pointed out earlier, increasing core traits takes a lot of XP. See, then we have the augmentations. So first we have our, and it's noted that this is a very limited list of augmentations, and it only goes to one through three of each aug. Yeah. So we have arm implants, which the effects the effects do stack. There's a one percent chance of biofeedback, and then it shows the trait noise per rank. So it so. At rank one, you'd get heart, you'd you'd get six heart um, trait noise and four power trait noise. Yep. And for rank one, you get increased melee and unarmed damage by one d four kinetic, and add plus one percent gain extra attack line to your FC. Mm -hmm. Rank two, you get a lift modifier increased by half over again, and then. At rank three, you increase your melee and unarmed damage by a further one d four kinetic. Yep. So <coughs> we have we have armor plating, which just which grants which is going to grant soak. Um, audio and audio enhancers, which is going to be boosting your percep um, perception as well as being able to still being able to still make projectile attacks when you're blinded at a higher rank. Um. Let's see, biopharma deluxe. Which which makes you a walking, talking paragon of vitality and rejuvenation. I do. I will admit that I do like the setup. And <laughs> laser cannon. Um, one might say that some people might use the laser cannon to do the to do the um gun to do the gun arm thing. If I if I were to install laser cannon, that's not the approach that I would take. Has a two percent biofeedback chance, monk. Mm -hmm. Especially since you choose where it shoots from. The laser is about the size of a cucumber. Is surface mounted, mm -hmm. and is not easily hidden. On the plus side, the laser is always deployed and ready to fire. You do realize that what that. One of uh, that one of us or one of our friends might use might use this to replicate um, a weak sauce version of breast fire from Mazinger. 
You're not thinking with portals, monk. Remember that he also has a missile that's dangerously close to his groin area. That's true. Um, let's see then mim mimicry, which I think it. I think that I'd. I. I think with something like the mimicry um, augmentation, we've gone. Pa we've gone past James Bond and are starting to enter Mission Impossible. But up. Uh... Let's see, pheromone secretions. I can think. I can think of who would be taking that kind of thing. Uh, refraction field. Bruh, anybody on on um infiltration or intrigue would take pheromone secretions. Mm -hmm. Rank one alone, plus one d four to all social rolls. Let's see, refra um, refraction field, which basically now we're in optics. now. I was going to say, now we're in Metal Gear. Or we can just we can just dip back into Ghost in the Shell again, because this is definitely Thermoptics. Especially the Rank 3 ability, even though it costs 12 Legend. For three minutes, you cannot be captured on video surveillance or recording devices, and you don't trigger any motion senses. You are visible to biological creatures and are not hidden from thermal detection. So it's, it is just opti optic camouflage, so it is Metal Gear. But if anybody wants to be Gray Fox, that's how you do it. Mm. No, Ghost only affects electronic targets. Biological creatures can just see you. Mm -hmm. So essentially Ghost turns you into Tyler Durden. Although, by that point, you you do have plus 2d4 to stealth rolls. Mm-hmm. Uh, then we have Signal Jammer. So, a, 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 mob, a mobile version of a chaff grenade. Nice. You have to have multiple Signal Jammers if you're going to target multiple devices. Mm -hmm. No thanks. <laughs> Although at third rank, the th th at third rank, the maximum r the maximum range is fifty meters. An additional fifty meters. Yeah, an additional fifty meters. I'm pretty sure it's cumulative. the The actual jammer starts with a maximum range of ten meters. Mm -hmm. Oh no, no, its max range is fifty meters. Mm -hmm. Never mind. I read that wrong. Mm -hmm. Only one target can be dis can be disabled, but you can install multiple versions if you want to target multiple devices at the same time, with the same quick action. Hmm, who does this remind me of? Ah! Yes, it reminds me of the Hacker Man from Kill a Kill. <laughs> then we get um, magic. Once again, you have to have Shin P in order to use ma in order to speak to the Kami. Magical effects are known as rotes because the character attempting to enact it must perform certain actions or recite specific words to convince the kami to manifest the result. So they have to recite mantras and make mudras. Mm -hmm. Got it. <laughs> For those of you who don't know what that means, a mantra is, well, it's a word from Sanskrit that basically means a practiced phrase mm -hmm. and a mudra is a hand sigil if any of you have ever seen naruto what they do to cast jutsu those are mudras mm -hmm. just done really fast and made to look flashy oh, so... and since casting the since casting these ropes requires certain prescribed structures Casting in Nuetto requires the use of skills that the subject Kami find appealing or convincing. So we we don't have fire and forget because because ca because casting is a skill roll. Good. We don't have fire and forget because spirits are fickle and you have to convince them to do what you want. Mm -hmm. The number of rotes you know is initially determined by your path. You can gain additional rotes by spending XP and gaining ranks in your path. 
Let's see, and then we have the whole thing with the Kami. And the Kami you're, you have access to is determined by their path. As you progress through the ranks, you, gain, you can gain access to more Kami. Oh, and then we have the whole thing with the Mikata. Which we've talked about before is basically a familiar. The Kami from yep. let's the Kami from every tier offer Mikata bonuses, and the higher the tier, the stronger the bonuses. You can't change your Mikata though, so if you want to gain a spirit ally from the higher tiers, you'll have to wait until your character has access to those tiers. Yep. And so casting a road either co costs either a Move, quick, or full action. Roads that require that you roads require that you make a roll based on your shin p ranks rolled plus an appropriate skill, versus a target number determined by the rote. Many roads have effects that are defined by the am amount of the caster's roll divided by the target number, i.e., roll divided by tn. These results are only applicable in integers, and the roundup rule applies. So if you roll a 19 and the TN is 6, your result is considered to be a 4. All roads have a legend cost, as cajoling the, the Kami is the furthest thing from ordinary. So not only is legend your extra effort die, it's your MP. It yeah. did say that earlier, that your Chi would be legend. So they have a range, a duration. You you may maintain a number of active rotes with a duration longer than immediate equal to your p path rank times two. An ongoing rote may be halted or cancelled by an opposed caster who spends ten legend and makes a full active full action Shin P plus skip plus skill roll. This roll is made at disadvantage unless the caster has access to the Kami that created the rote. This, this attempt may only ever affect one rote at a time and cannot affect a rote with a duration of immediate or permanent. So that's our counterspell rules out of, out of there. Yep. See, that's, a pretty, that's a pretty... That's um, a pretty... It's a pretty expensive counterspell, too. Remember, if you... If you use 10 Legend to do certain things and you fail, you lose one permanent Legend. Then we have, of course, the the tiers of kami, as well as well as a short list of so, of some of the kami that are available. Um, as well as well as their particular ro their particular rotes and some of the, and some of the bonuses that you can get from them. Tier zero includes things like alcohol, books, charcoal, clocks, dreams, ice. Locks, pain, rain, rope, sleep, silence, solitude, sparks, sunlight, tea ceremony, and the wheel. Tier Does it one... mean the wheel is in the tarot? Oh, we'll check later. Tier one are. Oh no, insects, I know what it is. Language, light, numbers, peace, plants, and weather. Tier two is chi, earth, electricity, metal, and water. And everything tier th three and up is hidden in the main book. Mm -hmm. Let's see. The wheel is a symbol of both balance and change, and its kami are incredibly diverse. Some are as stoic as the mountains, knowing that balance will always be restored, while others are violent, even malevolent har harbingers of change. Regardless of your perspective, their alliance grants you plus two to defense. It's, um, it's... It's the wheel from Sanskrit and Buddhism and such. The wheel, the wheel of of samsara. Mm -hmm. Let's see, and each kami grants <sighs> it, grants it. Each kami from t, I'd say t, it looks like tier one and tier two are the ones that are actually going to grant rotes. Yeah, the tier zero kami grants you like this passive. Which, is, which I'm guessing is a permanent route. I can't. It doesn't. It looks like the, it looks like it's just a straight up passive if you choose that as a Mikata. Mm, I don't think it's a. 
I don't think you have to choose it as a Mikado. Because you get you get Rotes being associated with with Kami, but I don't think you have to have them as Mikado technically, do you? No, I don't think so. I think I think the Kami you have access to is going to be path dependent. I think yeah. that's what they said. So if you get if I think if you get it, you'd probably get you'd probably um get th get that particular bonus. Let me ch let me check what it had to say about Mikado. Um, if you gain a Mikado. If you gain a Mikado by choosing Magic Priority A, you may choose any Mikado from the Tier 0 or Tier 1 list. You can only ever have one Mikado if you would grant um, more than one. Again, it, you double or triple the bonus from your one Mikado. Yeah. But I, uh, I, don't think, I don't think that this is technically Mikado assignment, though. Any, anyways. I think, uh... Oh, go ahead. It mentions it might be just for the passives, but then why would you ever get a tier zero Mikata? That is a good question. Um, I I don't th that's let me um let me check let me check one of the paths. And I'm Yeah, it's usually when it comes to paths, you'll get you can ch you can choose a Mikata and th and then learn r and then learn rotes from certain lists. You can choose your Mikata or from the or from Kami you prefer. So it isn't it isn't the it isn't that level of limitation that I thought it was at first. Mm hmm. Um. And each com each kami seems to gr seems to grant its own little list of um spe of spells or rotes. It doesn't look like you're unless you really dedicate. It doesn't look like you're gonna have a whole lot of a whole lot of um rotes to choose from. Uh, let's see, and then we get to back we get to um backgrounds. And your background points determine the rank, and these are at a scale of one to one hundred. From one to ten, it's at rank one. Then from eleven to thirty, rank two. Thirty-one to sixty-five, rank three. Sixty-six to ninety, rank four. And ninety-one to a hundred, rank five. Yep. Um. Hmm. And this is something that you would that you would roll. So let me see. let me see. I'm trying to trying to see if is it a case where you'd roll where you'd roll it the way you roll traits or not? Rolling background each background. Da, da, da. You choose to roll your back. Because of the because of the fact that it's that it go that it caps at one hundred, I do think you're rolling your background as a percentile roll. You probably are. Uh, or actually no. Or not it says when a situation like this com comes up, you declare your intention to roll your background and describe what it is you're trying to achieve. The storyteller will assign a scenario that scenario a difficulty target number depending on how reasonable or not the situation is. You use a full action, spend 5 temp legend, then roll your background using 1d10 per rank in an attempt to meet the assigned TN. If you meet or exceed it, you your imagined scenario becomes reality. If not, you just gotta do something the hard way. Seems reasonable. Mm -hmm. So and we have age, which is which which um seems which is going to be granting going to be granting some trait bonuses. 
and it's the only background that cannot be increased later with experience points. Oh, then we have contacts, i.e. who i.e. who you know. Mm -hmm. oh. And I do appreciate that contacts is a universal thing instead of having to list off individual contacts, which means possibly having to create micro versions of sh of character sheet, which would not be good. see then we have um and we have some example we also have a few examples for what would be considered allies mm -hmm. and i do i do love the the um the, the examples for rank 5 either you're in the illuminati or they're in the illuminati the minister of defense the ceo of a tech giant a member of the number 1 k-pop band <laughs> See then, and Lerman Murder. Yep. Then we have followers, which works about. Although I love, I love the bottom one. If you have any followers at all, it's three dudes on Reddit who liked your, like your post in college about the price of sushi. <laughs> uh, status is exactly what one would think one would think it is. Oh, and sa same thing that goes with wealth. Oh, although there is a bit of an aside saying items, equipment, and property and services all have a currency price and a cost TN. If you have the cash available, anyone can pay an item's price to obtain it. Alternatively, you can roll your wealth to determine if you can simply afford it without having to dig around your pockets for coin. The storyteller will determine how often you can do this depending on your rank in this background. Someone with rank 2 wealth can probably roll once or twice a month to see if they can afford a weapon upgrade or top tier massage, but anything more than that will deplete their bank account in the short term. You can only <coughs> earn, earn income during play or doing jobs or whatever. Their words, not mine. The wealth background is used for things you'd like to purchase without explaining how you got the money. Hmm. That seems... Interesting. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to act, when it comes to the action economy, as we mentioned before, you've got one move action, one quick action, and one full action, mm -hmm. with a decent um, action economy. I do hope to see a ch I do hope down the road to see a cheat sheet when it comes to the actions, so that you can s so that you can share that. Yeah. Um. A little a little easier to see at a glance. Yep. And we have a six step setup for combat. Although I like the way it opens. Need to chop someone up? Stop here. Start here. I don't know why I said stop. Um, first, determine if anyone is surprised. If so, set their initiative to 1. Then determine the initiative order. Mm. Then determine if anyone is exposed. Then any character who's not demoralized may use one quick action, quick action or interrupt to attack an enemy that is exposed to them. This uses up their quick action for the round. No move actions during step 4. All actions in step four occur in the order of initiative. Characters who are who are surprised may not act in this step on the first round of combat. Then step five, once all applicable attacks against exposed targets are resolved, the, ro the round continues with characters taking their turn in order of initiative. Interrupts can be used during any step if an appropriate trigger occurs. And then the round ends and we start with step one again. Um... The step four part, I, f I do find a bit, uh, I do find a bit um, interesting, because we have three, we have three things that can mess with turn order: um, surprised, exposed, and demoralized. Yeah. And surprised, well, for one, your initiative is set to one, and it cannot be increased. Two, all attacks against surprise targets are made at advantage until the, until they take their first turn. Um, not quite as broken as some games with you know if you're unaware that that entire opening uh, opening round could be your death knell yep um, with initiative it does say that you can re you can voluntarily reduce your initiative in a round but only by multiples of 10 I'm guessing 
I think this is their version of delayed action. Hmm. Probably. Like a little bit, at least. I can see I can see the, the framework of it. Mm -hmm. oh. Then we have exposed. I, you're exposed if you're not in half or full cover, or you're not engaged in combat with an enemy within one meter, i.e. adjacent. If you're in melee combat, no one is exposed to you. That is, you're too busy to get any free attacks in step four if you're engaged in combat with an adjacent enemy. So in in other words, in other words, if you're not if you're not scrapping with if you're not in a fight with somebody, um, get to cover. Yeah. Take cover. Um, I do want I do wonder in that regard how this how this particular game. If this is gonna if this is gonna handle is it gonna be more of a leaning towards map combat or theater of the mind. Mm. I don't see anything that would that would denote that it prefer that prefers one or the other. I don't I can't really say, especially since I don't know, there's just something there. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see, when it comes to projectile attacks those are per those are perception based and the unlike melee combat where the opponent has the chance to defend themselves the difficulty to hit with a ranged weapon is a function of size and distance target size is multiplied by your weapon's range modifier to to obtain the final tn of your shot Hmm. So, it, and then we have an example. So the sh the shotgun has a short range of three meters and a mod of t of times two, and its long range is five meters and the modifier is three times. So if they're within short range, you use the short range modifier to determine target number. Um, this also means that be that being the bit that. Um, let's actually let let me check the example if, so I make so I have my math correct. So, to um, Tobolu is in combat with a with Merrick, a human. It's his turn, and she wants to shoot with the standard shotgun. Merrick is five meters away, which is considered long range for that weapon. So the t the t n to hit Merrick is size times times range modifier. So and so. So that's three. So, the size is five. The range modifier is, th is three. So fifteen. Yeah. Uh, and let's see. You can take aim, and then we. And then we have the whole thing with raises, which. Increases the TN of your attack by five, but for each raise, you can add one D10 to your damage roll. I find this a very simplified version of the raise concept it, that was in L5R. Mm -hmm. Um, because it, because at that with that one, you had a mix of raises and free raises. And truth be told, I usually house ruled it that you could, you could you, you could choose a raise effect afterwards, based on how many multiples of five you rolled over. Mm -hmm. um, largely, bec largely because I need I needed something tangible to give people a reason to do a raise. Whereas with this, well, you have something tangible. It's basically the power attack rules. <laughs> but raises can ol only be called on projectile attacks. See, so then we have me then we have melee. Um, and it is all about getting over their defense trait. And there is also a further discussion on dodge, which adds to the TN of both melee and unarmed attacks against you, but can only affect one attack per round unless noted otherwise. It is a, yeah. it is a quick action interrupt. Yeah. When you do it, you roll your dodge, skill only, no traits, and add the total of this roll to the attacker's TN to hit you. Nice. 
If you elect to roll your fate card on your dodge and get a critical, you automatically avoid unless they also roll a critical. If if that happens, looks they cancel each other out. And so then you just go by raw metrics again. Mm -hmm. um, damage works about what how one would expect. There's no um, there's no extra da there's no extra damage setup, and soak is well damage reduction. Yeah, by the number stated from the sources assigned. Yep. <sighs> with project, there's there's also a concept of a burst reroll when it co when it comes to it, as well as burst ammo for range for um, projectile damage. Mm -hmm. Um, if it has the burst feature, it can be fired in bursts which does not affect the attack roll or grant extra attacks. Rather, you'd be considered to be holding down the trigger, resulting in more ammo being used. If, it is, if, is, if it's an, a success, you roll damage as normal, but may continue to add and reroll any results as shown in the burst reroll column. Burst fire also uses up the volume of ammunition indicated in the burst ammo column, which will more quickly empty the magazine. Mm -hmm. So it's Burst is basically expanded explosion when it comes to dot when it comes to damage. Well, I mean that's if you hit explosion. Mm -hmm. um, I thought only core traits could do d10s. Um, only d no, they said only d10s can do can do um, explosion. Can explode, but the the dam the damage that they show for say for say the rifles those are d10s. Okay, okay, I, I was misunderstanding. Uh, the rolls we're talking about purely on the damage rolls, then, because I know, like, to hit, say you have a rifle, you'd use, you know, small arms and and uh, oh, small arms. Was that a was that a was that savvy or was that something else? You you'd roll you you'd roll the the attribute. And the skill for small arms, and only the core trait has is able to roll d10s. That's what I, is for the attack roll. Mm -hmm. But then the rifle has a damage of d10, and that would explode a bunch. But that's, but then that's only if you hit tens. If for the street rifle in the example, it uses the gunnery skill. Mm -hmm. Um, damage is d damage is d10. If you roll it as burst. You'd you'd um, roll damage as normal, but any nines or tens would explode. That's pretty nice. The ca the ch the catch is that your fire is that you're using five shots instead of just one. Mm hmm. Yeah. Um, then we have melee damage, which is which uses your po which uses your power plus the appropriate weapon damage. I want to make a joke, but that joke just doesn't fit here and isn't good, so I won't make that joke. So, of course, you're rolling your power as d10s, and then you roll the d12. A katana d does melee damage of 1d12 plus power. Wow, your weave blade does 1d12 damage, of course. Mm -hmm. Weave blade, go! Oh. Although, what I do find what I do find fairly interesting with this is, if I'm reading this right... You're get you're gonna be a bit squishy. I think that's kind of the point. I mean, you've got you've got plenty of ways of getting away from da of getting away from damage, but it's gonna add up quick. Especially since um, HP is usually heart times HP modifier, which usually is one and a half. Although there are ways to increase that modifier, and much like in L five R, you have a you have a um a gradual wound setup with the, with the less and less less health that you have. Yeah. So at it starts at ninety percent minus one, seventy five percent minus three, twenty five percent minus five, ten percent minus seven. And zero minus ten. Yep, minus ten to all rolls, and you're burning your temporary legend. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a bit of a rule for grappling, which is a power plus unarmed uh, check. 
grap and the grappling setup here is still bet is still better than um D and D third edition grappling. Low bar. Yes, it is. Oh. And then we ha we have what you'd expect with stealth. Then two weapon fighting. Okay, this is where things are gonna get interesting. Oh. Various skills and paths grant a level of two weapon fighting. For example, light melee three, and each skill, path, etc. that grants TWF is cumulative. Cumulative. Um. And all of these assume you are fighting with a weapon in each hand. If you gain levels of two weapon fighting but don't need or want to use two weapons, you still gain the non-attack bonuses described above. In addition, when you successfully attack with your one weapon, you add the two weapon fighting rank to the damage roll for that weapon. King Hooray! We have another we have another case of two weapon fighting that doesn't suck. We are not do we are not doing that age old pay to not suck thing. Oh. Which I'll take I'll take that any day of the week. <laughs> Look I've Yeah. I mean, and you're really not even paying for it. It's the where we've seen it, the two up and fighting stuff comes from your path or your lineage or both. Mm -hmm. So it's not only not pay to not suck or even pay for two weapon fighting, it's get two weapon fighting and just get better, even if you're not going to use two weapon fighting. Yep. Let's see, then we have squat we have squad morale. Which I think it I think is one of one of the instances of using um team synergy that the game wants. Squad morale, you mean? Yeah, squad morale. Um, it revolves around two opposing concepts, i.e., which are amped up and demoralized. They can, both of these can only be applied to whole teams. When your squad is amped up, any character that's amped up gets an automatic re refresh of two, plus two legend temporary legend at the start of their turn, and has their wound penalties reduced by one. Ooh. <laughs> If so they're, if they're demoralized, they suffer a minus five to both initiative and resolve. Oof. Worse, they can no longer take quick action interrupts versus exposed targets. Oof. And base and basically they are they are described as shell shocked or depressed. I mean, and if they don't snap out of it, the fight will be over quickly. Yeah. Yeah. And. And of course, these systems. The first way that the first way that these kind of things can can be applied is the rally skill. Any character with rally can use a full action at any point to attempt to apply the amped up status to their squad. Uh, you roll heart plus rally and add an additional d10 for every squad member who chips into the spirited call. The tn is equal to is equal to the number of known or visible enemies times eight. If it's successful, the squad because amp becomes amped up and stays that way, assuming they engage in combat for the next few minutes. The fault, but there's a few triggers that will remove the condition. Anyone going to zero HP, anyone becoming intimidated or afraid, or a successful demoralized attempt by an opposing squad. <coughs> But the but it's not like they become demoralized immediately. They just lose amped up. The other option mm -hmm. is the tactic skill, which it which is an opposed contest that can be used to demoralize the enemy. And obviously, you can't be both amped up and demoralized. One cancels the other. Yeah. Um. And while the, while this isn't the same while this isn't the same high level of team synergy we saw in Heavens and Heresies. Because of all the stuff that Neo Edo is doing, oh, sorry, New Edo is doing, um, I think it's a sufficient setup. It is. Definitely. Um, then we get to, <laughs> then we get to dueling. Oh, hey. I feel like I'm in L5R again. Yep. Which is a stage-based approach. The first is Bravado. 
Um, in each player t takes turns telling their opponent one statistic. This is optional. It can end in one of two ways: either the combatants have enough and settle into the duel, or one combatant realizes they're outmatched and forfeits. Hmm. And the vi if the forfeit happens, the victor gains one permanent point of legend. I made you give up by telling you that I'm just fucking better. Mm -hmm. So yeah, more legend for me. Yep. Let's see, then assessment. Neither, uh, nobody rolls their fate during stage two. Both roll perception plus meditation. Um, the character with the higher roll gets a dual bonus <sighs> equal to their roll minus their opponent's. The character with the higher role determines if they want to move to the next stage. If they choose not to proceed, the second combatant has a chance to declare if they wish to move to attack. If neither attacks, then the role is made again. The higher, the one who gets the higher role gets a dual bonus. Again. Dual bonuses are cumulative, so it's possible the first combatant may increase their bonus, or if the second combatant rolls higher than both combatants, they... <clears throat> But then both combatants will have a dual bonus. After the role is determined who has the higher dual bonus, that character then decides if they would like to attack. If they choose not to, once again, the second combatant may choose. The process repeats until someone declares their attack. Oh. So you could just sit there meditating menacingly back and forth. Mm -hmm. Both combatants. Both combatants must declare how much of their dual bonus they'll add to their first attack, the which will be added to their the balance, if any, will be added to their damage roll, assuming they get that far. This is declared prior to rolling fates. Both roll fates and resolve any fate lines, though any fates that grant extra actions do not resolve until stage 3 is complete. They then roll reflex plus the appropriate martial skill at the same time, adding any dual bonus that was previously declared. Um, I think it's important to note that if they roll their fate and they both roll a critical, then they both do damage simultaneously, which may result in a draw or mutual death. <laughs> Double KO, anybody? Yep. Oh. The, and the, the, refle the reflex roll that I mentioned before, that determines who acts first and also functions as the attack roll. For the first attack, the TN to hit is determined based on the we based on the weapon used. If the first attack hits, any unspent dual dual bo dual bonus points can be added to damage. If the opponent survives this attack and the duel is not to first blood, then the opponent's reflex plus skill plus skill roll can can is used to determine if they also hit. If the second attacker has any remaining dual points and successfully lands an attack, then those can be added to the damage roll. The damage done by any successful attack is rolled as usual for the weapon being used, with the remaining dual bonus applied if available. Then at stage 4, if the duel was to first blood, it's over as soon as one combatant lands a successful hit. If it's to the death, then assuming both combatants survive stage 3, it continues with normal combat rules. Oh, it's Ghost of Tsushima style. Yeah, this is this is not too far removed from the du from the dual rules that we saw in L five R, but it is a bit simplified because while it's still a bidding game, and still and still a, a bidding with a com with a mix of a game of chicken, the key difference that I see here is the fact that you that um it is that it's not a case of fi of using your role to fi to figure out facts about your opponent. That happens right out of the gate. Instead the, instead the what we have is a game of chicken to see how high you want to do the dual bonus. But of course if you get a if you get a good dual bonus but end up missing the second one, you could end up being the second attacker. Um, I like it, but once again I want that cheat sheet. Um, we have a similar yeah. thing with social con with social contests, but not not as co not as complex. Although I have to love how it describes the use of the meat of the meditation role, the art of not giving a fuck. <laughs> <laughs> the meditation skill is the dodge of social interactions. 
which works. Basically, Go ahead. Basically, someone says some mad shit to you. You just look at them and look away. Mm -hmm. um, and we have some errata for non-combat systems, then um, status conditions, then with character development... Um, this it, it you do you do level you do level your stuff up using XP. Yeah. Like and this this XP system reminds me a lot of World of Darkness. Mm -hmm. Core traits are one point. Uh, of trait costs two XP per, uh, per current rank in that trait. So, for exa uh, the example given is you have 15 power. That's rank one. Yep. You'd like exactly. to increase it to 16. Two po two XP per point raised. So, for example, if you're just going to raise it to 16. That's two points. But if you wanted to say get to the next tier, rate uh, rank rank two, you you'd have to get five points. So that'd be 10 XP total. I do like that for augs on the cost summary table it says nope. Um, <laughs> you can spend XP to expand the fate card, but it's three it's it's three XP per percent, but one percent per session and must be an existing fate. This is also probably the way you reduce your botch. And the and the the last the last bit of stuff is um is equipment, along with a appendix on on um, character creation. Yeah. And a fur a further one on pet creation, as certain paths um can sum can let you summon or create a pet. That be those paths being the Sebishi Clan Onikiri and Onmyunji. Which will have eat, which can get can get either a animal, kami, or a robot. Yeah. Uh, and then a example of pet creation at the back. So at the end of this long journey, that covers what we have with New Edo. Um, the vibe that I, the vibe that I get out of it is, if we haven't made it clear. There is a lot of Legend of the Five Rings DNA in New Edo. Yep. However, it doesn't have some of the issues that Legend of the Five Rings can can end up having. Run into, yeah. Um, I'm a, I'm the, when I say it's reminding me of Legend of the Five Rings, I'm specifically referring to third and fourth edition. Fifth edition is an entirely different animal. Second edition is in the halls of we don't talk about that, and first edition is alright, but it is crude. In Monk, there's no such thing as second edi edition. Why do you keep bringing it up? Because if I don't, people are get people won't learn. Okay, fair. Fair, fair. Um. However, I'd say I'd say one one of the big problems that the roll and keep system had. Is that there was always is that there was never there was never really enough incentive to not invest in traits because it, because investing in a trait would not only get you an extra die to roll but also an extra die to keep. Yeah. And with skills, yes, yeah, buying skills was cheaper, but it would just grant you extra die to roll, not and not keep, and. Oh, and folk and focuses. I forget the actual name. I'm just calling it that for now. Mm -hmm. All of that, all of that did is it granted is it would grant you a um, reroll. Yeah. And yes, there were mastery abilities, but e but even with that, the mastery abilities weren't get, weren't going to compare to the fact that you'd get an extra die to keep rolling a trait. Um. And of course, and of course, there was the issue of a shitload of skills, as a lot of games have. But the, I'd say the bigger, I'd say one of the other big issues to contend with is the fact that L five R technically uses spell slots. The, 
the uh, the approach that, the approach that it has is that your um your tra your trait rank in rings determines how many um how many spells of that type you can cast with um void slots being used for either void spells or as a universal mm -hmm. um of course the problem with this is that is that even at high even at the highest echelons the amount of spells you're going to be able to cast with before having to do a recharge is going to be limited yeah and while spell use is certainly going to be limited in New Edo, I don't think it's going to... It doesn't seem like it's going to be as restrictive. Is I do remember I do remember a long time ago someone, a someone asked me, would I, ha would I hate the Vancean model of spellcasting if spellcasting was, was something you had to roll for? No, I'd, no because, the, because the Fire and Forget isn't necessarily the problem. I'm ambivalent on Fire and Forget. The problem the problem was the f was the fact that the sp the spell slots never make never fit the logic the logic of the setting. And if they if they if they barely fit in D&D, &D, they actively wither in L5R. Yeah. I've are that's not to say I want. That's not to say I want casting to be a freebie. I just ha I'm just of the opinion that the restri the restriction on casting should make a bit of logical sense. Logical sense, and it shouldn't be exceptionally prohibitive. Mm -hmm. It should it should make you think about whether you really need to cast those resources, but never m need to make you feel like you need to hoard resources. Yeah. The other th the other thing to consider with L5R's setup with casting. Was the was the fact that yes at at the start every trait is at two. This this is this is most definitely a fact. However, it doesn't mean that you, it means that you'd have two of it means that you have two of the base four elements and and two free and two wild cards. So you'd only you so at start you'd only have four spells that you could cast, and the the um. Most pe most people aren't going to have tra aren't going to have starting traits beyond five, even at late game. Mm. So the so unlike a lot of games where there where there's where at higher levels you're going to have a bigger variety of spells you can cast, you don't really get that. You don't really get that same feel. And L five R is not a low magic system. It's not a low. No, magic. it is. Kugan it is, is, is not low magic. No, it is not. That place is rife with it, and it's for it's for that reason that, as much as I love L five R to death, the magic system was always something that I would ha that I would house rule. Um, I think the approach I had instead is that you have a is that you have a escalating series of penalties the more you the more you more times you use magic in a scene. So kind of like um how. Uh, Shadowrun's magic casts from HP. Uh, the approach I had is that you you just had you just had a ca you just did the casting roll, but every every time you cast that same element beyond the fr your um trait was essentially your safe casting um threshold. Every time you'd cast it from that element beyond that, um you'd start to take um penalties to the roll. Yeah. Okay. So not exa not exactly the drain rules in Shadowrun or the fatigue rules in Slayer's D20. Yeah, but still a a fatigue penalty of some sort. Yeah. Oh. Uh, and of course, of course, um, I remember I remember someone saying that that would make it a little too easy for someone to cast void spells. Well, technically I suppose, but the only way you're getting void spells. Is by be is by being a phoenix shugenja. Yep. Um. The other thing, as I mentioned before, when it comes to dueling, I like the fact that dueling is far more straightforward here in terms of what you're getting. Again, last time it last time it was it was you learn you learn de you learn details, and here it's a here it's a case of a game of chicken. Yeah. Although. Announce if if you're really really 
um, confident in, in the combat ability that you want to uh, reveal, and you reveal it, that, that that could be the end of the duel right there. Um, although you, although you know what immediately comes to mind with that first phase in the duel system here. Hmm. Oh, you're approaching me. I have to approach you if I'm gonna hit you. <laughs> then come as close as you like. <laughs> That's basically what it is. Yeah. But. There are, there are a few things that I, th I think needs clarification. I like the concept of each kami providing it providing a set of a set of ropes that it has access to. Mm -hmm. um, I def I'll, al I'll always prefer a, bun a set of micro lists instead of a ma instead of a big ass spell list. Yeah. Ironic since we're making a big ass spell list. Mm, uh, but are we really? We're making we're making a large ass spell list only in the fact that there are many spell names, but it's essentially a tiered spell list. Everything could be you could logically extra extrapolate from the from the tier one spell. Fair. Now, when it comes to, but I'd like to call I'd like to call back to the to um that acronym that we brought up at the start of this. Crunch light, yeah, crunch easily light. managed. Um, as far as the as far as the crunch, how well do you, based on what we've seen with New Edo, how well do you think it holds up to that title? Um, considering how many different types of dice can potentially go into rolls, and considering how some rules will require a little more in depth. Uh, dice usage and statistics usage. Mm -hmm. I, this is this is about middle of the road from what I've seen. Yeah, I I don't consider when I can when I think of a crunch light game, I'm thinking of something like Fate. Yeah. Much as I yeah with Fate, it it certainly qualifies. Powered by the Apocalypse would count as crunch light. Um, Marvel Saga would count as cr would count as crunch light. Yeah. To a, um, certain, to a certain extent, um, Besom would count as crunch light, largely because putting aside character creation, a lot of the actual crunch in play is f pretty straightforward. Yeah, I was going to say, it's crunch light after character creation, because character creation is not crunch light in Besom. No. Holy shit. Um, and then, of course, going back to another thing that we've seen on Valley, uh, the Tidebreaker... A uh, quick start, I would say, is crunch lights. Whether that's due to the necessity of a 14-page document, or just the system as it is, mm -hmm. it's pretty crunch light. However, I would say that the second half of the statement, easily managed, is true. Yes, it, it, it's not necessarily crunch light all the time. Um, maybe character creation is probably the least crunchy part. Character creation is because of because of the priority system is. This is going to be one of those cases where it's going to be front loaded. Um, yeah, I don't see a, I don't see a whole lot of spots where we're gonna where I'm gonna have the analysis paralysis problem that I see often with games with elaborate skill systems. Yeah, if I can give one bit of advice for down the road, maybe 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 um can maybe put in some advice about what sort of builds would be better for what skills. If there is. One thing that um, that I really like about Shadowrun, because the, the the priority system is just feels straight out of Shadowrun Five. Mm -hmm. Um, they did have some really good examples of this is what a street samurai will look like. This is what a technomancer will look like. This is what a decker looks like. Mm -hmm. And while that's only guidelines so you don't have to use those exact uh layouts it did give a good idea of character direction yeah now in the quick start there's a, there's a couple exam there's a couple examples of character creation and pet creation however i've always i've always been of the mindset that i prefer example archetypes rather than a full-on example character 
Yeah. So you, you wanna you wanna give something that says, here's a general thing that X fits into. Yeah. If I need to provide an example of what I mean by by the by that kind of archetype, consider the way mutants and masterminds handles archetypes. Okay. Um, yeah. Paragon, energy controller, gadgeteer. These are not full on characters. Yeah. Uh, especially in third edition, there's a whole there's a whole chart there's a whole life path like chart that you can use to tweak to tweak those mm -hmm. concepts uh, um in a slight manner without overwhelming. Uh, and uh and again going back to like I said, going back to Shadowrun, um Street Samurai, Decker, Technomancer, um uh, all, all of those particular names are names of not not a character, something that a character could be, depending on what they're using. Yeah. I know I've joked about the classes but not classes that um, shot, that Shadowrun has. Mm -hmm. Because it, it claims to be full-on freeform, and yet there are certain archetypes that people will play as. I don't think that applies here, because we are because there already is an archetype that people are going to be playing as in the form of paths. Yeah. Um, the paths give you the paths give you a, a pretty general directive. Now, one other issue that hap that crops up in L5R that isn't related to mechanics that I do think should be explored in a GM section for the book um, pertains to lore. With the clans one of the bi one of the big issues is because of because of how the relationships with clans are set up there's the inevitable question of how are you going to get people from multiple clans into a party the most common answer is they're all emerald magistrates yep that's the that's the easiest answer but it is a problem that do that does have to be addressed and a lot of games that have some sort of um, faction system um, have to find a way to address this kind of thing. It's the reason why the only way you could do it, you could reasonably do a Space Marine RPG with 40k is to utilize the Death Watch as your template. Because the Death Watch pulls from everything, yeah. Yeah. Um, and we do see that there are factions in the game that would very much be at odds with each other. Yeah. Just, um, just the, uh, the the metro the metro rescue department and the uh, and the the most polite bastards you'll ever you'll ever meet those guys are clearly at odds being organized crime and the cops yeah now i'm not i'm not saying i'm not saying that you that one that in one or the in one or the other you've got you have to cut you have to cut off certain archetypes i'm not i'm not going with that for one for one second yeah there's no, like that sort of limitation is never really that good no what i what i am go, what i am going what i am going with with this is that i think i think that there should be some advice on how on how does on how to set up the for lack of a better term the in medias res when you have when you have a party for, wh that has representatives from multiple factions yeah, it's to boil it down even further. It's how do you deal with characters that would not normally associate mm -hmm. and make them associate? I do think I do think one easy answer is to have all of them be mercenaries with different backgrounds. That's an easy answer, but it's also. It's an answer that comes with its own questions, as it is. Yeah, it's it's also not usually a satisfying one. Like, it's about, oh, you're all mercenaries. It's, it's about okay. As satisfying as you all meet in a tavern. How many corners does the tavern have? Ranger plus one. <laughs> it's always n plus one, where n is equivalent to the amount of rangers in the bar. But uh, I I do rem I do remember that when before before it uh, before it fell before it fell apart when I was I was in a I was in a um 
Ra a Pathfinder Ravenloft campaign with routes. And the setup that he had as as GM was we were all we were all crusaders coming back coming back from the cru coming back from the crusades. Essentially we were all knights in one form or another. And that and um that was that was how we all knew each other is the f is the fact that we, we had fought in, we had fought in a, in a crusade. Um, okay. And of course, that's one example. Some some games do some other games do have that kind of thing where they'll give a sh they'll give a short list of part of um of party types. Um, mm -hmm. Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay Third Edition made it into a full on mechanic. Yeah. And. Um, Coriolis also does this. There's mul there's multiple um, multiple party talents that can that can be utilized. And I'm totally not bringing that up because I li because I liked how the Coriolis review turned out. <laughs> not at all. But this is this is something that d that does need to be does need to be looked at. Mm hmm. Um, and I'm not. I'm not saying. I'm not saying stop. Ev stop everything. You could. It could just. It could just as easily be. So be something that it. Be something that is. Um. Addr addressed in it. Addressed in a blog post or something like that. But so it's something to keep in mind. Yeah. Um. I'd say what the only uh, the only other th the one thing that wasn't covered. And would and would probably be a would probably be a obstacle to run to running the game with just the co with just the core system is the is a lack of encounters a lack of adversaries. Yeah. Not knowing it, how to properly create and or scale adversaries. Yeah, and I I could I could whip something I could pull a few out of my ass on my own, but it is something to consider. Yeah. I would I would like to see, I would like to see how the game is going to hand would handle um, adversary design if it's a case of a simpler version of a standard character or if there's something different. But in, mm. as far as far as it as far as this this being a game design a game designed for custom characterization, I'd say it meets that to a T. And I think the best I think one of the best mechanics that it brings in honestly. Is the potential of the fate card? Yeah, that fate card is a, uh, especially since you can get new fates added to it and expand those fates, especially from some of your paths. Mm -hmm. That card's going to be an interesting little, uh, interesting little spanner in the works. Oh yes. Now, with with all that said, I think we've more or less exhausted every de every detail regarding. Regarding New Edo, I do apologize for some for accidentally calling it Neo Edo a couple times, but I think we I think we covered everything. Oh. We, unless we wanted to get into pedantic levels of detail, yeah, yeah, and the pedantic levels of detail are things that we are things that we save for the Friday episodes of Valley of the Judged. And New Edo is not our Friday runner right now. That's still Veil of the Void, and I love it, and we're going to do classes on Friday. Yay! Mm -hmm. Well, A class. Yeah. Um, <laughs> tomorrow, though, we're co we're um, covering what I foolishly thought I was covering tonight. Foolish fool who fools about fooling. Wait, I'm not Francesca von Karma. Yes, I hope not. I, don't f I, can see you I can see you breaking out the whip, but no. I don't. I don't look that good in a mini skirt, monk. <laughs> but with that, with that said, I would a, once, as always, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come to come onto the show and enjoy the madness at play here. And there will be more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present. My name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody.